Shabbat Shalom, Hebrews and Hebrews. It's exciting to be back here again with you guys this week. And I hope everyone's week went well for you. My nine-week-old daughter, Rivka, found her happy thought this week. As some of you guys know, because I've been sharing some pictures, I call her the ever-serious Rivka. And she very rarely smiles. She has like the most concentrated face. But she apparently found her happy thought, entered the laughing place, and she has been just smiling it up, gaining vocabulary. Um, she's kind of lost some of her ahs, though I just hear, I just heard her just now in the other room going, ah, but uh, she's got more gurgling sounds. It's fun. Babies are awesome. I love it, especially having a, a, uh, a second girl in the house. And Michael, hopefully your week went well as well and everybody else here. Now, we, of course, are in the Genesis Targum back into it. We took a couple weeks off and next week we'll be getting back into my study on Romans chapter six, as well as continuing the Genesis Targum. And hopefully we'll get through chapters 10 and 11 of the Genesis tonight. So with that, I want to open in prayer. Do we have any volunteers? Is there anyone who would like to open us in prayer? I'll take a stab at it. Thank you, Sarah. Sure. Most high Yahuwah, Abba, we come before you today united as a group who love you and who are searching for your truth. And we know that your truth is in you and is in your son Yahusha and in Ruach HaKodesh. We thank you so much for this Shabbat. We need it so badly, Father. Please open our hearts and give us ears to hear the information tonight, Father, as we soak in your word and we fellowship together and we lift up one another and united in corporate prayer. Thank you so much for your servants who stepped forward to serve you and to serve all of us. We praise you. We give you all glory in all things. So thankful to be here, Abba. We love you. We love you so much. We pray all this in Yahusha's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm going to be opening up chapters 10 and 11, going reading through that. And then I'm going to be handing it right over to Michael for the first commentary. So here we go. These are the generations of the son of, sons of Noah and of the sons who were born to them after the deluge. The sons of Yapeth were Gomer and Magog and Madai and Yavin and Thubal and Meshik and Theris. And the names of their providences, Afriki, or Africa, and Germania, and Midi, and Macedonia, and Itinia, and Asia, and Tharki, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. And the sons of Yavin were Elisha, Elis, and Tarsus, Acacia, and Dordonia. That's some really fascinating names in there. Tarsus. Hmm. From these were distributed the tribes of the islands of the Gentiles, everyone according to his language, to his kindred in their nations. And the sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim, and that would be Egypt, uh, and Phut and Canaan. And the names, name of their provinces, Arabia and Mizraim, again Egypt, and Alatrach and Canaan. And the sons of Cush were Seba and Havila and Sapta and Rayama and Saptika, and the name of their providences were Sinirai and Hindiki and Simadi and Lubai and Zingai, and the sons of Maritinos was, uh, I can't even pronounce a ZM, but uh, Margad and Mizag. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began, to might, he began to be mighty in sin and to rebel before Yahuwah in the earth. He was mighty. He was a mighty rebel before Yahuwah. Therefore, it is said, from the day that the world was created, there hath not been a Nimrod, mighty in hunting and a rebel before Yahuwah. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel the Great, and Hades, and Netzebin, and Ketespan in the land of Pontos. From the land went forth Nimrod and reigned in Arthur because he would not be in the council of a divided generation. And he left those four cities and Yahuwah thereupon gave him a place. And he builded four other cities, Nineveh and 
Palatiath, Kartha, and Perioth. And Talisar, which was builded between Nineveh and um, Hadiah, that is a great city. And Mizraim begat the Nevate, and the Mariate, and the Levake, and the uh, Pantasine, and the Pathrosim, and the Naziote, and the Pantapolate, uh, from whom went forth the Philiste and the Caphodike. And Canaan begat Zidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebuse and the Emore and the Gergeshe and the Hive and the Erke and the Antose and the Lutase and the Chomps. I should have had Michael you read this this week. I'm <laughs> I should have I should have made you be the glutton for punishment. Uh, and the uh Antikoe, and after then the seed of the Canaanite was were scattered. And the limit of the Canaanite from was from Gothanus going up to Gerar, unto Aza, unto Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, unto Kaldahi. Kaldahi. These are the sons of Ham, according to the seed of their genealogies, after their languages, and the dwelling of their lands, and the kindred of their people. And to Shem also was born a son. He is the father of all the sons of the Hebrews, the brother of Yapheth, great in the fear of Yahuwah. The sons of Shem, Elam, and Ather, and Ar uh, Arpachshad, and Lud, and Aram. Arpachshad begat Shelach, and Shelach begat Eber. And to Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, because in his days the earth was divided, and the name of the other, Joktan, or Yachtan. And Yachtan begat Ilmodad, who measured or lined the earth with lines. And Shelath, or Shelith, who led forth the waters of rivers. And Chatsarmivath and Yarak and Herodam and Uzal and Dikla and Oval and Avimael and Sheba and Ophir and Havilah and Yobab, all these are the sons of Yoktan. And the house of their dwelling was from Mesha, by which thou goest up a uh, Steparve, a mountain of the east. These are the sons of Shem, according to their houses and the dwelling of their lands, according to the kindred of their people. These are the houses of the sons of Noah, according to their houses and their peoples, and from them are the people distinguished, distinguished in the earth after the deluge. Chapter 11. And all the earth was of one language, and one speech, and one counsel, and the holy language spake they, that by which the world had been created at the beginning. And it was while they were sojourning from the east that they found a plain in the land of Babel, and dwelt there. And they said, a man to his fellow, come. We will cast bricks and put them in the furnace. And they had brick for stone and slime for cement. And they said, come, we will build us a city and a tower. And the head of it shall come to, what, to the summits of the heavens. And we will make us an image for worship on the top of it and put a sword in his hand to act against the array of war before that we be scattered on the face of the earth. And Yahuwah was revealed to punish them for the work of the city and the tower which the sons of men builded. And Yahuwah said, Behold, the people is one, and the language of all of them one, and this they have thought to do, and now they will not be restrained from doing whatever they imagine. And Yahuwah said to the seventy angels which stand before him, Come, we will descend and will there commingle their language, that a man shall not understand the speech of his neighbor. And the word of Yahuwah was revealed against the city, and with him seventy angels, having reference to seventy nations each having its own language, and thence the writing of its own hand, and he dispersed them from thence upon the face of the earth into seventy languages. And one knew not what his neighbor would say, but one slew the other, and they ceased from building the city. Therefore he called the name of it Babel, because there did Yahuwah commingle the speech of all the inhabitants of the earth, and from thence did Yahuwah disperse them upon the faces of all the earth. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a son of a hundred years, and he begat Arpachshad two years after the deluge, and Shem lived after he had begotten Arpachshad five hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And Arpachshad lived thirty and five years and begat Shelach. And Arpachshad lived after he had begotten Shelach four hundred and thirty years and begat sons and daughters. And Shelach lived thirty years and begat Eber. And Shelach lived after he had begotten Eber four hundred and three years and begat sons and daughters. 
And Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. And Eber lived after he had begotten Peleg 430 years and begat sons and daughters. And Peleg lived 30 years and begat Ryu. And Peleg lived after he had begotten Ryu 209 years and begat sons and daughters. And Ryu lived 32 years and begat Sarug. And Ryu lived after he had begotten Sarug 207 years and begat sons and daughters. And Sarug lived 30 years and begat Nahor. And Sarug lived after he had begotten Nahor 200 years and begat sons and daughters. And Nahor lived 29 years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he had begotten Terah 119 years and begat sons and daughters. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram and Nahor and Haran. These are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And it was when Nimrod had cast Abram into the furnace of fire because he would not worship his idol. And the fire had no power to burn him. That Haran's heart became doubtful, saying, If Nimrod overcome, I will be on his side. But if Abram, Abram overcome, I will be on his side. And when all the people who were there saw that the fire had no power over Abram, they said in their hearts, Is not Haran the brother of Abram full of divinations and charms? And has he not uttered spells over the fire that it should not burn his brother? Immediately uh, there fell fire from the high heavens and consumed him. And Haran died in the sight of Terah, his father, where he was burned in the land of his nativity and the furnace of fire, which the Kazdai had made for Abram, his brother. And Abram and Nahor took to them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah. And the name of the wife of Nahor was Milka, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milka and the father of Iska, who was Sarah. And Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot bar Haran, the son of his son, and his daughter-in-law, Sarah, the wife of Abram, his son, and went forth with them from Ura of the Kazdai to go to the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. All right, so that concludes the readings of Genesis 10 and 11. I am handing it over to you, Michael, for first commentary. Great job with those names. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I enjoyed my few weeks off getting rebooted, but uh, it's great to be back, and I love you all. Um, chapter 10, so mainly genealogy, right? So I'm going to start on, let's go with number one. So now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them the sons born after the flood. And I'm going to do this a few times this study, but I'm going to paste what Jasher has to say about it in the chat. Only read certain parts, so you guys can read it. And it won't let me, because it's too long. Interesting. <laughs> so we got to get server boosted. Uh, let's see if this works. Wow. Excuse me. Let's go and I'll just cut it shorter here. So this is Jasher 8. Wow, it is not letting me. All right, guys. So please just go to Chapter 8 of Jasher if you have it. Um, yeah. Let me try that, find that for you. I should have cussed this beforehand. There's chapter 8 if you want to read along. Um, but I'm only going to read a few. But I think it does a great job describing kind of this instant. So... Um, and it came to pass in the beginning of the 33rd Jubilee that they divided, 33rd Jubilee, interesting, that they divided the earth into three parts for Shem, Ham, and Japheth, according to the inheritance of each in the first year in the first week when one of us who had been sent was with them. And he called his sons and they drew nigh to him, they and their children, and he divided the earth into lots, which his three sons were to take in possession. And they reached out forth their hands and took the writing out of the bosom of Noah, their father. So this is the one I want to highlight here. I'll paste this one. Writing as Shem's lot, the middle of the earth, which he should take as an inheritance for himself. So is that, is that uh, the middle of a globe, middle of a flat plane, inside the earth? I don't know. And for his sons, for the generations of eternity, from the middle of the mountain range of Rafa, from the mouth of the water from the river Tina, and his portion goes towards the west through the midst of this river. And it extends till it reaches the water of the abysses 
out of which this river goes forth and pours its water into the sea Meat. And this river flows into the great sea. And all that is towards the north is Japheth. And all that is towards the south is Shem. And then continuing, continuing. I thought this was cool reading about this part. It says, And he knew that the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies, and the dwelling of the Lord, and Mount Sinai, the center of the desert, and Mount Zion, the center of the navel of the earth. These three were created as holy places facing each other. So a few things here. First, I thought of Rob and Ronit's presentation. You know, I haven't done a deep study on it. I did watch it a few times, but I know they, they talked about this, and I wonder if they incorporated Joshua. Forgive me if they did. And then it's saying the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies. And I know, based on my studies, which would throw it off if this is correct, uh, in Revelation 21, I believe, it says there's no temple in the New Jerusalem. And when you like, kind of study it, it means the Holy of Holies. Is this saying that the Garden of Eden technically won't be there? I don't know. Um, I don't know. So, but that, that, those two things stuck out. Obviously, the center, center of the navel of the earth. To me, that's, you know, that, that just speaks flat earth, a flat plain center. That's where the paradise is. That's where the, you know, Israel will, will gather. Um, okay, so I'm going to add another. So I'm not going to, hopefully Josh can uh, highlight that. But these are the differences that I noticed in these verses. So I'm not going to read all of them, but I want to highlight you know, number two says, The sons of Japheth, Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiras. Palestinian pretty much does the same thing. But then it talks about their provinces, their lands. So, Afriki, Germana, Medi, Macedonia, Latina, Asia, Tarki. Uh, the next one, Asia, Farku, Barbary. Um, I Italy, Italia, a uh, number four. Are you kidding me? Um, that hits home. <laughs> um, number six. Arabia, Mitzrayim, Canaan, and then number seven. You can read those as well, like the Targums. And if you notice, I took a few Jerusalem. And I'll be talking a lot, or some about, about Jerusalem Targum as well, and the differences. But what do you guys make of these? Look at all these, how, how the, they take, you know, they just basically show where these, you know, these sons went. What do you guys make of all these? Uh, I wonder if there's something to the names into the country, if we can link it to an English transliteration of what it would be today. Um, I will do one more, chapter 9, and then hand it to Noel. Um, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. Jerusalem, okay, cool. Uh, Jerusalem, Targum, was mighty in hunting and in sin before the Lord, for he was a hunter of the sons of men in their languages. And he said to them, leave the judgments of Shem and adhere to the judgments of Nimrod. On this account it is said, as Nimrod the mighty, mighty in hunting and in sin before the Lord. So again, the Jerusalem Targum adds way more. So sure, he was a mighty hunter, but and in sin. And he hunted the sons of men in their languages. He wanted one language. He wanted that uni unity. And he said to them, leave the judgments of Shem, the righteous judgments of Shem, and inherited the judgments of Nimrod. Very interesting. Okay, first word study. Uh, he was a mighty hunter. And then Nimrod, the mighty hunter. That's the same word used a few times. Two times. Let's see. Three times for Esau. Go figure, right? So Genesis 25 says, when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. Um, continuing, now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. So that word game is the same as hunter. Genesis 27. Now Rebekah was listening while Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game to bring home. Uh, behold, I heard your father speak to brother Esau saying, bring me some game. So again, very similar. Hunter, game, Esau, Nimrod connections. We know about those. Um, the last Esau connection. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled violently and said, Who then was he who hunted game and brought it to me? Again, same thing. But then the other time it was used. I'm going to post this. I thought this was really interesting. 
13, 15. In those days I saw in Judah some of who were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading, loading them on donkeys, as well as wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads. And they brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I admonished them on the day they sold food. That word food is the same as game and hunting. And so it made me think, did Esau and Nimrod do this on a Sabbath day? I don't know. What do you guys make about, about that? Did they hunt on Sabbath day? Um, or even that story of you know Jacob and Esau. Um, did, did that happen on a Sabbath day? I have no clue. But I'll continue reading. Also men of Tyre were living there who imported fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath, even in Jerusalem. Then I reprimanded the nobles of Judah and said to them, who, What is this evil thing you are doing by profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do the same, so that our, our God brought us uh, brought on us and on the city all this trouble? Yet you are adding to the wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Again, just thought it was interesting. These, these same words, I, and obviously the root word could be used a million times, but the same word was used in these passages, and I thought it was interesting. Is it possible... Jacob and Esau and Nimrod, they did a lot of their damage on a Sabbath day. Um, I will pass it off to Noel. I have a lot more. Well, I'm going to be covering some material tonight that is going to be maybe a surprise to some of you. And by that, not what people are expecting. I will be covering some old material tonight that some people are familiar with and some new material that you've never heard of before. And I'll give you a little bit, a bit of a preview. As you guys know that chapters 11 and the whereabouts is kind of important to understanding our timeline, our history. And what I won't be doing tonight is showing you the Septuagint lined up with the Masoretic, when the Aramaic Targum agrees with the Masoretic in the, in the difference of years. There is, um, what was it? It was like several hundred to a thousand years difference between the Masoretic and the LL text. And, you know, that, that's quite a bit. Right. So according to the LXX, we're much later in history now. I need to uh, silence. If somebody could just help, you know, silence someone's mic if they come in loud. I hear somebody else. OK, I'll do this. All right, there we go. So there's there's three problems, if you want to call them problems, that I have found. All right. If you move the timetable up to the LXX, there are three people that are greatly affected by it. One is Shem, the other is Nimrod, and we'll get to those two this week. And one we'll be addressing in probably a week or two, and that would be Og. If you increase the timeline with the LXX, all of a sudden, Nimrod, Shem, and Og are living much, much, much longer. All right, so that's something to consider. What is going on here? All right, so with that, let's begin. And I'll be getting to that tonight, hopefully. Now, the first thing we see here in verse 1, 2, and 3 is a bunch of names. And I don't have the time to go over all these names tonight. I, I, I think that there is a world of knowledge going on with where these people were situated, um, where they, uh, you know, the countries and so on and so forth. I'll give you one little thing later on. We'll get to it is Peleg. It says that Peleg was alive in the time of the division. And... It's kind of like that meme you guys have seen where there's a car driving down the highway and all of a sudden there's this exit and it, it's a last minute detour and it just skids over there. That's what happens whenever we get to Pay Lake because, you know, we're like, oh, no, evolution is bad. We're not going with that whole narrative. But then the evolutionists will tell us there was this place called Pangea and at some time in history, all the continents split. I'm sorry if I'm stepping on any toes right now. It's not my intent. But what happens is as soon as we get to Peleg, we're like, oh, we don't believe evolution. But, oh, you know, we're going to go to the Pangea route, and this is when the continents split. But if you look at the context of this entire chapter, it's not talking about Pangea. It's not talking about continents going adrift. It is talking about the separation, the division of land, of inheritance. That's the whole context of the chapter. And so Peleg was alive in a time when the division of the land happens. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. You can, it just makes the most contextual sense when we read this. Well, look what we see in, in verse 2. The sons of Yapeth were Gomer and Magog. Well, where have we seen that before? Well, that's interesting. So you look up in Hebrew Revelation, 
or just Revelation, I'll be reading from Hebrew Revelation, but Revelation 27, 9 in the Hebrew says this, but after a thousand years, Hasatan will be delivered from his captivity. Then he will go to deceive the nations and the four ends of the earth and Gog and Magog to gather his army to come to war. And their number is like the sand of the sea. And they trampled over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the armies of the set apart ones and the beloved city. Then fire fell from the heavens and burned them up. I'm not going to comment on uh, the short season, so to speak. Well, actually, I am. I take that back. I'm not going to be commenting on the camp of the saints or the beloved city or anything like that. So who is Magog? Right? Because here we see that Magog is the son of Yapheth. And in a short season, it seems like Magog is really important to the narrative. All right. Growing up, I was told by the writers of eschatology, all of whom were sponsored by the Zionists, let's face it, they were, that the masked identity of Gog Magog derives from the Soviet Union. And of course, we see the bear, you know, raising its paws again with Ukraine right now, right? Another half truth. The logic flows as follows. Gog's location is described by Ezekiel as residing in the north, the northern parts. And he says that in chapter 38 and 39. The Hebrew word denotes extreme or uttermost parts. And Russia is the nation situated in the extreme or uttermost parts directly north of Yasharel. What these same people don't want you to know is that the communist revolution was a Jewish one. Yeah, I just went there. Oh, so on a flat, motionless plain, the extreme or uttermost parts of the north would be North America. And that's not even talking about the moon map at this point. Okay, so we, we can see that again in um, chapter one and two. And oh, yeah, let's read verse two. It says, uh, then I, I missed this point. So the sons of Yapeth were Gomer and Magog. And then we read that, and the names of their provinces were Africa and Germania. All right, so that's interesting. Bagog was most certainly a person, but in the but his land wasn't simply Gog or Magog; it was Germania. That blows the lid off the entire operation right there. The Aramaic Targum, you know, rarely ceases to dis disappoint, and this is one of them. Next verse, we read this, and the sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz. Gomer was another son of Yapheth and brother of Magog. He had a son named Ashkenaz, to ring a bell to a certain people group, recognize the name. Ashkenazi is the Hebrew word for German. When a Jew is identified as Ashkenazi, they're referring to their Eastern European descent. What they're not doing is tracing their genealogy to Shem through Abraham. No, they're tracing their genealogy through the German peoples to Yapheth. The forefather of the Ashkenazi was Ashkenaz. Today, the Ashkenazim constitute more than 80% of all recognized Jews in the world. Many of them still speak Yiddish. Yiddish may have Hebrew and Aramaic elements to it, but also that of German and Slavic languages. They're not the Yahudim from the Bible. But the narrative is set up in such a way as to ensure you, you'll never notice. Now, I have a point to where I'm going with all this. And this is, you know, some of you may recognize this as some of my older material, and that's okay. The sons of Ashkenaz will call you an anti-Semite, quote unquote, for recognizing the obvious, that they're not Semitic. I mean, think about that. If you recognize that they're not Semitic, you are anti-Semitic. It's brilliant from an Orwellian perspective. And anyways, identifying Ashkenaz with Germany disproves my, well, okay, it doesn't disprove, it dis, it, it dis, whatever, we'll, we'll just check that out. Uh, national borders change all the time. Finding a map which accurately details the exact fence line for Yafis children has never been discovered. But that's beside the point, as they're all neighbors. Saying there's no Magog in Ashkenaz, uh, Ashkenaz connection is like disqualifying the residents of Compton or Inglewood as possible gang members because they're technically just beyond the recognized border of South Central Los Angeles. Did you notice the Afriki reference in the, in the land settlement? That's not referring to Africa. Africa was the inheritance of Ham. It was the Romans who later claimed its northern settlements in, in the land of Afri. Pull a word search on that and the internet will throw question marks your way, but we know better. 
It's in the Targum. Afri is a reference to the sons of Yapet. Geography repackaged into confusion became an art form long ago, and we'll have to keep reading. All right. So um, we see this in, in Jubilee 719. The sons of Japheth were uh, Gomer or Gimmer and Magog, and Madai and Yavin, Tubal and Mashik and Thurak. So, um, these are the sons of Noah. So the Book of uh, Jubilees or Yorv, Yorvhildim agrees with the sons of Japheth given to us in Genesis. Once again, we see the listing of brothers, Gomer and Magog. I, I turn there simply to establish that fact. And now jumping forward a couple of chapters in the Jubilees, we read the following. And the first portion came forth for Gomer to the east from the north side to the river Tina. And I believe that um, uh, Michael talked about the river Tina tonight. And in the north there came forth for Magog all the inner portions of the north until it reaches to the Sea of Niat. So I combed through several old maps for any mention of the Sea of Miat, but with no success. Not even the internet cared to recognize what I was talking about, aside from redirections to Jubilees. The only sea currently residing above Germany is the Baltic Sea. And um, there's this book called um, Ag Ag Agricola in Germania, reportedly written in 98 AD. Uh, Tacitus described the Baltic as Mare Subicum, Subicum, still no help. All right, so if the Black Sea or the Caspian Sea is being referred to, then again, I can find no reference, no relation to Niat. Perhaps that is because our maps are a deception. Don't need to go into all that right now. Now, according to Jerome, who was alive in 342, 420, according to the official narrative, Magog was situated beyond the uh, Caucasus near the Caspian Sea. So take a mental note of that. Let's see if I could put in a, a map here of this. All right. Boom, there's your map for you. Oh, that's really small. Can't really read that too well, can you? Why is it so small? Here's another one. Maybe that's a little bit bigger. Nope, they're both small. All right. Well, anyways, you can see that Magog inscribed. You can see Magog. If you can zoom in on that, um, I think you could probably still see it. Magog is inscribed directly above the Caspian Sea. Gomer's position staged left with the Ashkenaz straddling the shores of the Black Sea. So you, you might say close but no cigar, right? But the only problem with that is, is the Ashkenazi Jews don't derive merely from that little region directly below the Black Sea. In a post-mud flood society, the Ashkenazi emerged in the land surrounding the Black Sea and directly above the Caspian, straight up into the fatherland and even as far east as Russia. It's all Magog territory. All right. I'm going to skip some of this. So, all right. Let's see. Let's skip some of this history. I have tons of note on the history here, but um, now I'm going to go ahead and read this. Here's a little clip here. Let's throw in. Let's throw in some Wikipedia into our discussions tonight. Yeah, this is all blurry. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. This is all blurry for you tonight. All right. So according to the Wikipedia, legend was attached to Gog and Magog. We're trying to find where Gog and Magog is. Okay, just the context. If I need to reel you back in and what important that is to us today. A legend was attached to Gog and Magog by the time of the Roman period that the gates of Alexander were erected by Alexander the Great to repel the tribe uh, of Gog and Magog. Uh, Romanized Jewish historian Josephus knew them as the nation descended from Magog, the Japhites, as in Genesis, and explained them to be the Scythians. In the hands of early Christian writers, they became apocalyptic hordes. Throughout the Middle Ages, they were variously identified as the Vikings, the Huns, the Khazars, the Mongols, the Turanians, or other nomads, or even the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. Huh, that's odd. It says the legend, uh, legendary gates of Alexandria were erected by Alexander the Great in hopes of keeping the Gogites and the Magogians out. It's only a little susp <laughs> I'll skip that part. Uh, but it looks like he didn't do a very good job of it anyhow, and I'll give you tell you why. As the state of Israel is swarming with Ashkenazi. Hopefully you see where I'm going with this. I'm pretty sure they walked right over the border. There's a couple of contenders for the location of Alexander's Gate, by the way, and our controllers don't want to give it away. Uh, but then notice the Wikip what Wikipedia offers next for us. It says Josephus knew them as the nation descended from Magog, the Jaff Jaff uh, Jaffatite, and explained them to be the Scythians. All right. You might be asking yourself, who are the Scythians? I asked myself the same question. The answer isn't hard to find. It's been right in front of us our entire time. 
the Scythians and the Ashkenazi are the same. I will show you another Wikipedia picture here that's blurry. So you better get your reading glasses on because that's pretty blurry. Even the Wikipedia agrees. In the, in the article relating to Ashkenaz, to the, uh, to the sons of Gimmer, we quickly learned that the ancients identified the kingdom of Ashkenaz with the Scythians. All right. A little later on down the turnpike, as official history goes, we then read how the Scythians became the Slavic people, eventually blending in with the Germans. As if that's not provocative enough, the next two paragraphs offer us the following admission. Let's see what it says next two paragraphs here in my little cutout, my blurry uh, needing reading glasses cutout. Jewish, co Jewish culture arose in the geographical area known as the Rhineland of Western Germany. There it is. The Ashkenaz isn't simply a coincidental to the country of origin. No, they're making a direct connotation to the people of origin, the Scythians and the Ashkenazi. And by the way, fingering someone as a Scythian was no different in ancient times than calling them a goth. All right, so think about, well, we'll talk about that later. Some of the earliest references to the goths derive from Ambrose who equated the Scythians and Goths with the biblical Gog and Magog. Call them whatever you want, Scythian, Ashkenazi, or Goth, but they're all the same people, and that is the kingdom of Magog. So here's my quick conclusion if you have been following. Clearly, the modern-day 1948 conquest of Israel is an Ashkenazi invasion of the land, and I get the feeling that the attack on the camp of Yah will be led by the Zionists. I told you I was going to go tonight to places where you probably weren't expecting. Um, but this is the amazing thing about these genealogies. They, put, they don't put these in here for no purpose at all. I mean, you study where all these people come from and you start you know, connecting names later on in scripture and stuff. It's absolutely incredible. And so my, my position here is that the modern state of Israel, the 1948 Israel, is uh, the, the sons of Ashkenaz. This, the, and more specifically, Magog, guys. Like we talked about the Gog-Magog invasion. What I'm saying is, is that what we're having in Israel is a clear contender of the Magog invasion. And when we eventually get to New Jerusalem coming down, the, the camp of Yah, who is it that's going to be leading it when Satan surrounds the four corners of the earth? He's putting Gog Magog together. He's putting the Magog people group together. And um, I, think, <laughs> I think it's going to be a Zionist invasion. So with that, I'm handing it back to Michael. <clears throat> That was very interesting. I'll have to re-listen to that when it gets posted. Um, so Genesis 10, you know, there's a big conspiracy between 70 or 72 nations. So the table of nations listed and found in Genesis 10 includes the list of founders of 70 or 72 nations descending from Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, of course, Masoretic and Septuagint are way off. Um, Masoretic lists... 26 descendants of Shem, 30 descendants of Ham, 14 Japheth. 56 plus 14, you get 70. LXX has 15 names for Japheth. So 14 in Masoretic, 15 in LXX. 30 for Ham, so Ham is the same. 27 for Shem, so another one in Shem. And that's where you get your 72. So the LXX adds Elisa, E-L-I-S-A, and Canaan, C-A-I-N-A-N. Okay, so some of the earliest sources for 72 languages are uh, the right Clement of Alexandria, Syriac Book of Treasures, St. Augustine's The City of God, and Hippolytus. Now, this is Midrash on the whole 7270 debate. So, Midrash. It has been suggested that 72 nations are the 70 Noahite nations plus Israel and Edom. Interesting. Some say that a straightforward reading of chapter 10 suggests 73 nations, thus 72 may have been reached by excluding the Philistines in Genesis 10:14, who are designated as a mixed race. The divine voice that made itself heard, or her heard, at Sinai divided itself into 70 tongues. And then they give a source in rabbinic literature there. Um, the 70 members of the Sanhedrin were likewise thought to correspond to the 70 nations of the world. And that's in Jerusalem Targum, uh, Genesis 28. Um, and if you know your New Testament, you know there's a similar issue. Luke 10, starting on number 1. 
Berean Study Bible. And this the Lord appointed 72 others, sent them two by two. Berean Literal Bible. Now after these things, the Lord also appointed 72 others. And then when you get to King Jimmy, they love their Masoretic. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70. And New King, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others. So again, you have King Jimmy loves the Masoretic. Some of the other ones possibly go back to the LXX. What do you guys think about that? What do you guys think about the 70 or 72? I know, I believe in Exodus, there's a discrepancy with Joseph's family, whether it's 70 or 72. Uh, maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's the LXX. Maybe that's, I got to do my research on that, but I love that part. Okay, so some more stuff on Nimrod. We're going to be talking about him a, a lot, I'm, on this, I'm sure. But um, the Book of Jubilees mentions the name of Nebrod, N-E-B-R-O-D the Greek form of Nimrod, only as being the father of Azerod, the wife of Eber and mother of Peleg. This account would thus make Nimrod an ancestor of Abraham and hence all of Hebrews. Perk the Rabbi Eleazar, as then quotes from him a lot, um, relates that, it, and this is similar to Jasher, relates the Jewish traditions that Nimrod inherited the garments of Adam and Eve from his father Cush. And that made him invincible. Nimrod's party then defeated the Japhites, Japhetites to assume universal rulership. Later, Esau, grandson of Abraham, ambushed, beheaded, and robbed Nimrod. And yeah, it goes to Jasher, and then which adds Nim, Nim, in Jasher, Nimrod had a son named Mardon, who was even more wicked. I couldn't find much on this except for this exact paragraph, but a portent in the stars tells Nimrod and his astrologers of the impending birth of Abraham would put an end to idolatry. Nimrod, which is similar to Herod, right, and Pharaoh. Nimrod therefore orders the killing of all newborn babies. However, Abraham's mother escapes into the fields and gives birth secretly. At a young age, Abraham recognizes God and starts worshiping him. He confronts Nimrod and tells him face to face to cease his idolatry. Whereupon Nimrod orders him burned at the stake. Um, and I, I think... Uh... Movies, right? Doesn't that talk about that as well? In some versions, Nimrod has subjects gather wood for four whole years so as to burn Abraham in the biggest bonfire the world had ever seen. Yet when the fire is lit, Abraham walks out unscathed. Wow. Um, Alexander Hislop, in his track, The Two Babylons, I know our brother Lee uh, reads this book a lot and takes stuff from it, identified Nimrod with Ninus, who was part of the Mesopotamian king list who, according to Greek mythology, was a Mesopotamian king and husband of Queen Semiramis. Um, and this was cool. This is how they program you. Nimrod, this usage is often said to have been popularized by the Looney Tunes character Bugs Money, sarcastically referring to the hunter Elmer Fudd as Nimrod to highlight the difference between a mighty hunter and poor little Nimrod Fudd. But, however, it was in fact Daffy Duck who refers to Fudd as My N Little Nimrod in the 1948 short, What Makes Daffy Duck. There's your Disney programming. Um, and then Freemasonry. Can't, can't not talk about Nimrod and not mention that. So Nimrod figures in some very early versions of the history of Freemasonry, where he was said to have one of the fraternity's founders, have been one of the fraternity's founders. According to the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, the legend of the craft in the old constitutions refers to Nimrod as one of the founders of the Freemasonry. Freemasonry. So this is quoting. Thus in the York MS, number one, we read, At ye making of the Tower of Babel, there was a masonry first much esteemed of, and the king of Babylon, called Nimrod, was a mason himself, and loved well masons. And, you know, I know there's other books, writings of Abraham, that say he was a master mahon, but this is just another example. So the second time I'm going to post... Ooh, I can't do that. I just forgot to... So... Let me get the link again. So if you guys want to follow along. Ooh, take away that, that slash there. But um, Jasher chapter 12. I'm not going to read all of it. Just going to hop around, but if you uh, will follow along. So, and King Nimrod reigned securely. securely and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I probably should have put this in the next chapter. So I apologize, but we all know the story, right? Tower of Babel. And King Nimrod reigned securely, and all the earth was under his control. And all the earth was of one tongue, and words of union. And all, and all the princes of Nimrod and his great men took counsel together. 
foot, Mithraim, Cush, Canaan with their families. And they said to each other, Come, let us build ourselves a city, and in it a strong tower, and at its top reaching heaven. And we will make ourselves famed. Does that mean famous? I don't know. So that we may reign upon the whole world, in order that the evil of our enemies may cease from us. That we may reign mightily over them, and that they may not become scattered over the earth on account of their wars. Um, I know, you know, Skibus Research and others, you know, they talk about a one world government. It all, it's all based on Nimrod. And then these families put Mitzrayim, Cush, Canaan. Are they still in control today? Um, continuing in, J- in Jasher 12. And the building of the tower was unto them a transgression and a sin. Just the building of it. And they began to build it. And whilst they were building against the Lord God of heaven, they imagined in their hearts to war against him and to ascend into heaven. So again, judging their hearts. And now this is cool. So, and these people and their families divided themselves in three parts. And I'm sure I'm stealing no thunder here. But <laughs> first, they said, we will ascend into heaven and fight against them. The second said, we will ascend into heaven and place our own gods there and serve them. Just think of the ego. Third part, we will send to heaven and smite them with bows and spears. Like that's going to do anything. And Yah knew all their works and their evil thoughts. Okay, so... This was cool. And when they were building, they built themselves a great city. And a, I, I should have done this in the next chapter. I apologize. But in a very high and strong tower, and on account of it, the mortar and bricks did not reach the builders in their ascent of it until those who had went up had completed a full year. And after that, they reached the builders and gave them mortar and bricks. Um, let's see. They would weep when, when brick would fall because um, it would take a whole day. Let's see. Again, they casted arrows towards the heavens, and all the arrows fell upon them with blood. When they saw the blood, they they thought they actually slain those that are in heaven, but they're really just slaining their other people above them. Um, in continuing, it says, and God said to the seventy angels who stood foremost before him, the seventy angels. Um, then he says, let us descend and confuse their tongues. And so it says, and from that day following, they forgot each man his neighbor's tongue, that they could not understand one tongue. When the builder took from the hands of his neighbor lime or stone, which he did not order, the builder would cast it away and throw it upon his neighbor, that he would die. They would get upset because he he confused their tongues and then they couldn't understand each other and they started killing each other. Pretty crazy. Um, And then finally on this part, and and as to the tower which the sons of Mount built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up one third part thereof. A fire descended from heaven and burned another third. So the earth opened, swallowed, fire descended, burned another third. The other third is left to the day. And that is which is the loft and the circumference, three days walk. So there's your 33 again for the people that were trying to build the tower. Okay, uh, number 11. Uh, KGV says, Out of the land went forth Asher and built Nineveh. And the city Rehoboth and Kala. And you take the Palestinian, it gives a little more detail. So from that land went forth Nimrod and reigned in Ather, Asher. And here's the reason why. Because he would not be in the council of a divided generation. So he left. He didn't want to be. He wanted unity. He didn't want to be in a divided generation. He left those four cities, and the Lord thereupon gave him a place, and he built four other cities. Nineveh, Pelatha, Kartha, Perath. So it hit me today, you know, there's many talks about second exodus and all that kind of stuff, but we are to come out of Babylon. We are to come out of Babylon. Babel. What does it mean? So it's to be set apart. <laughs> we do not we we do not need to be unity with the world, right? We need to be set apart, doing his ways, and they come to us, right? I just hit me today. Babel on and reading what Nimrod did and how he wanted to unite everyone. Interesting. Um, let's see. So 21 says, Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder, even to him were children born. Palestinian says, And to Shem also was born a son. He is the father of all the sons of the Hebrews. Eber. Hebrew, Eber. The brother of Japheth, great in the fear of the Lord. Praise Yah. Um... And then continuing on 24, it says, And our Faxad beget Salah, and Salah beget Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, 
For in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. So the Aramaic or Hebrew root of Eber is connected with crossing over and the beyond. So um, considering that other names for descendants of Shem also stand for places, e Eber can also be considered the name of an area, perhaps near Assyria. So another number of scholars mention that the Hebrews, which some of us know, had received their name from Eber, which also pointing out that according to others, the name Hebrew meant those who cross. In reference to those who cross the Euphrates River with Abraham from Ur to Haran and then the land of Canaan. Eber roots, Hebrew roots. What, what do you make of that? I, I think this is true. Um, so like I said, Peleg means divided. Well, Joktan means, well, let me show you this. Joktan means to be smaller and significant. The verb katon means to be smaller and insignificant. As an adjective, it means to be small, young, or insignificant. The noun refers to the little finger. So be the least, be the least, be, the, be, the, be meek, uh, be set apart. We are not supposed to be large in number. Um, I don't know. What do you guys make about that? I, I, I continually see a pattern. I always talk about the sevens with one set apart. It just continues. We are not to be part of the multitude. The multitude needs refinement. We need to refine ourselves. Um, and then one more on chapter 10. I'll hand it back to Noel. So number 26 says, And Joktan beget Almodad, and Shalaf, and Hazar Meveth, and Jarah. Palestinian says, And Joktan beget Almodad, now, this was interesting. I have to post this. This is too good. Or lined the earth with lines. And Shalaf, who led forth the waters of rivers, measured the earth with lines. What is this? Longitude, latitude? I, I did a quick study, and I think 3rd century BCE was when the world tells us they measured the earth with lines. But Palestinian says this. So... How did this work? I need your help with that. And then finally, in Pseudo Philo's account, Joktan was first made prince over the children of Shem, just as Nim Nimrod and Fanuk were princes over the children of Ham and Japheth, respectively. In his version, the three princes command all persons to bake bricks for the Tower of Babel. However, 12, including several of Joktan's own sons, as well as Abraham and Lot, refuse the orders. Joktan smuggles them out of Shinar and into the mountains to the annoyance of the other two princes. I mean, there's just so much there. Abraham Lot refusing, the set apart refusing to build the Tower of Babel. They, they leave Shinar and head to the mountains. I don't know. What did Yeshua tell his people to do? Um, I have a lot on 11, but I'll hand it back to Noel. So my idea on the laying the lands actually fits in really well with the context of this entire chapter that... Um, I, I think that what he's doing, I don't think he's measuring the the breadth of the earth. So when when the person who, by the official narrative, measured the breadth of the earth was Aristosthenes, as you were mentioning, like second, third century BC. Uh, he did it in Egypt with a friend and a couple of sticks. And apparently he also um, flipped the earth on its axis as well. So he decided that we lived on a globe and he flipped the earth on its axis and it was all done in Alexandria. Uh, and then, of course, we see in Job, he asks the, the Yahuwah asks the questions, can you measure the breadth of the earth? And I don't believe it can be done. I think it's amazing that here we are in the uh, quote unquote supposedly 21st century and we have no accurate maps. You know, even a globe, the, the globe has like, what, 30, 50 different maps. Uh, we have no map of the earth uh, that is precise. We don't know the breadth of the earth. And I think that's amazing and a testimony to uh, to Yahuwah. Um, so. I, I just think it fits in the context of of he's like laying down lines of okay, uh, you know the sons of Ham have this, and um, it's interesting that it's actually Shem that's doing it and his sons, and and Nimrod obviously uh, was not amused by that as you pointed out, Michael, and there seems to be a, a, a stark contrast between Shem and Nimrod. Now, I told you guys earlier tonight that I'm going to be going in some odd directions tonight uh, probably what you did not expect and uh so here we go we're i'm going to be showing you a little bit of my research on nimrod and i don't think anyone has ever done this before no one has ever taken the position 
that I'm about to give you. So if you disagree, I'm totally okay with that. And um, Nimrod, I, I've had a lot of questions about Nimrod because a lot of people line him up to be Gilgamesh, right? And uh, probably multiple names. He probably had multiple different names. And in fact, as we just saw that if, if Nimrod is leaving where he is to establish other cities, he probably went by other names. He probably went by multiple names. I think that there might've been multiple Nimrods. Well, what if, I'm just going to throw this out there. What if Nimrod uh, lived more than once? What if he died and he came back and then he died and then he came back again? So hold on to your seat, uh, hold on to something. <laughs> just hold on to a loved one, whatever, if, if one is near to you, because I'm going to be showcasing or revealing uh, a paper that I haven't published. I, I, I put a lot of research into this probably last January, February, and then I got frustrated with it. I set it aside. I'm like, I don't know if the, if the world should see this, if it's ready for this yet, if I'm on the right trail, the wrong trail. Uh, but basically, I'm taking pre-flood uh, literature, like the Book of the Giants. I'm taking all sorts of stuff, and I'm trying to figure out who is Nimrod. So this will take several minutes, and uh, just listen in as I read through this. Shem Barnoa died 670 years before the birth of Abram, according to the Greek Septuagint. And that's a problem, but only for mortals. Shem became a Meshelzedek, you see, telling us that the school of Shem was one for the angels. Classes were initially held on Mount Zion. By the time that Yaakov became a student, however, the bookwork was being managed in paradise. And I actually made a case for that in uh, the Altar of Yahuwah um, paper I wrote and video I, I read. By the time, okay, so, and no, I don't care to explain myself all over again. This is a work in progress. For any number of reasons, I've decided to go with the timeline given to us in the LXX rather than the Masoretic. You guys know I feel that that's the more accurate timeline, and you'll just have to live with it. Try not to toss back and forth in bed tonight after writing a letter of complaint to your local representative. Contrarily, if you care to become one of my totally awesome serial readers and need caught up to speed, then I recommend reading the following papers. The first would be, as I mentioned, The Altar of Yahuwah. Um, it's called The Altar of Yahuwah, A Life, which I also last week in my presentation on the Stone of Scone referred to that repeatedly because I believe the Stone of Scone came from The Altar of Yahuwah. And the other one would be the 7,000-year timeline deception, which uh, probably has gone down as my most, uh, uh, definitely my most listened to video presentation so far. Uh, coming to terms with the immortal Shem storyline got me thinking. If Shem and Nimrod were contemporaries, then how was Yaakov's twin brother capable of killing him? That's what it says right here in the book of Jasher. And Nimrod and two of his men that were with him came to the place where they were. When Esau started suddenly from his lurking place and drew his sword and hastened and ran to Nimrod and cut off his head. And Nimrod would have been old, far too old to be off by Abraham's grandson. We're talking ballpark figures of 1,200 years old. I could accept that Esau cold cocked an old man in a wheelchair, but not even Methuselah sur uh, surpassed the thousand. I've already crunched the numbers. We'll go over my chart in a little while. Maybe not tonight. This is, I'm reading from my paper. But for now, try to follow along. Nimrod was Ham's grandson. Meanwhile, Shem's grandson, Canaan, lived only 330 years after his son, Shelah, was born, making him 460 in all. Tack on another 132 years between the birth of Canaan and the flood, and you can see that Canaan would have died 592 years after the flood. Abraham wouldn't have come along for another 500 years and some change. Well, Nimrod and Canaan were likely contemporaries, so what gives? And then I read stuff like this. This comes from the Book of the Two Pearls. This might be where you might want to hold on to a loved one. It came to pass that Shem, this is so epic. I mean, this is like Lord of the Rings epic. I love this. Let me start again. It came to pass that Shem marched with an army to Babel and overtook Nimrod in battle. I told you this was epic. The sword of Shem rent Nimrod asunder. Afterward, his whore, Nimrod's whore, not Shem's, found one part of his body and set up obelisks 
in honor of that foul thing she found. Hmm, I wonder what part of his body that was. I don't know. This is a family show, but uh, I could I could use my imagination. She kept it by her and even did unspeakable acts with it. The Book of the Two Pearls, 2-8. Well, that kind of just derails everything, don't it? Rather difficult to claim that Shem killed Nimrod in battle if Esau was the one to spring from the bushes and plant a roundhouse kick on the oldest man who ever lived some several hundred years later. What you're processing, while you're processing the apparent paradox, I've got another passage for your consideration. Warning, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, probably a good idea to read with bumbling lips rather than out loud. Well, I'm going to read it out loud for you. What I'm saying is hide the children, hide your wife, hide your children. <laughs> it goes something like this. Then oh, uh, this comes from the book of King Og, by the way. All right. So contextually, this takes place before the flood. Then Ogaius entered the blood pit of Baal of the earth. And Ogaius stepped forward and pulled at the head and skull of Nimrod as King Og pulled at his ankles. And Nimrod's neck gave first, and Ogaius wrenched it free. And as Nimrod's flesh tore, he gave up the ghost and was eaten with worms. And Ogaius and King Og in celebration, the great dragon of old, the pit and the fire in prep. Now, there's some dot, dot, dots in there. It's broken up text, but something about they were in celebration with the great fire, the great dragon of old. We know who that is um, in something about pit and fire. Probably didn't expect that. Nimrod's head was pulled off by brute strength rather de than decapitated. Graphic, I know. Seems like in every tale, his head is cut off. What killing is it? Don't say I didn't warn you, though. In any normal murder investigation, the, plausi the plausibly guilty will schmooze up to the investigator hoping to avoid the suspect's list. Not so with Nimrod, apparently. Shem seemed to skate under the radar, but then we have three other individuals anxiously lining up to claim they're responsible for doing him in. Esau, Ogaius, and Og. What I didn't tell you, though, is that the killing of Nimrod at the hands of Ogaius and Og happened on the day of Noah's flood. The, the flood water is literally coming in and killing everybody. And Og and Nimrod are having this, this brutal, epic battle with like hundreds of thousands of giants. And I know what you're already thinking. Nimrod was a grandson of Ham. Therefore, getting whacked while the ark set sail in the background is impossible. Is it, though? Perhaps so. I wasn't there and wouldn't really know. This is an open book test, and it just so happens to be where my report has landed. Three separate lives, three separate killings, three alternate timelines. So this is the story of Nimrod. Now, history never records for us the person Nimrod. Okay, we don't see him in any history books, except for the Bible, of course. We are given a short list of names to work with. King Ninus of Nineveh and Gilgamesh of Uruk are two contenders. Nobody is fingering Nebuchadnezzar II, and for seemingly obvious reasons, but I have my reasons for suspecting him as well. And then consider that it is only the writers of Scripture who refer to Moshe by name. Consider the following. Now, this comes from uh, Jasher, chapter 68, and I'm reading this for an important reason. And at the end of two years, when the child grew up, she brought him to the daughter of Pharaoh, and he was unto her a son. This is talking about Moshe. And she, uh, Bathia, called his name Moshe, where she said, because I drew him out of the water. And Amram, his father, called him Chavar, for he said it was for him that he associated with his woman whom he had turned away. And Yokeved, his mother, called his name uh, Yuketil. Okay, that's three names I'm counting so far. Because she said, that I have hoped for him to, uh, I've hoped to him for El Shaddai, and Elohim restored him unto me. And Miriam, his sister, called him Yered, that's four. For she descended after him to the river to know what his end would be. And Aaron, his brother, called his name Avi Zanuk, that's five, saying, My father left my mother and returned to her on his account. And Kohath, the father of Amram, called his name Avigdor, that's six. 
he's got Moses has a lot of different names so far because on his account did Elohim repair the breach of the house of Yaakov that they could no longer show their their male children into the water and their nurse called him Avi Soko so that's seven saying in his tabernacle was he hidden for three months on account of the children of Ham and all we're not done yet and all of Yasharel called his name Shema Yahu that's eight Son of Nathaniel, for they said in his days, as Elohim heard their cries and rescued them from their oppressors. And Moshe was in Pharaoh's house and was unto Bathia, Pharaoh's daughter, as a son. And Moshe grew up amongst the king's children. See what I mean? His mother called him, well, his mother called him Yekutiel, his son Yared. His brother called him Avi Zanuk. His father called him Chabar or Habar. His grandfather called him Abigdor. His nurse called him Avi Soko. Yashril called him Shima, Shima Yahu. It is only Bathia, his adoptive mother, and the daughter of Pharaoh who called him Moshe. We are not told, however, what Pharaoh called him. If I had to take a crack at it, I'd go with Amenabhet the fourth. That's what Pharaoh called him. Amenabhet the fourth. No, I can't prove that to be fact. It's another hunch and worth consideration. Here's why. His father, Amenabhet the third, was the sixth pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. And I know this is official history, but hear me out. Amen, uh, I can't even pronounce this tonight. Amenemetet the third had no son. He did, however, have a daughter. Her name was Sobik Nefuru. Well, Amenemetet the third and the princess still live. Amenemetet the fourth was not only adopted, but co-reigned with pharaoh for nine years over upper and lower Egypt. So I think that's who Moshe is. Did Sobek Nifuru raise him? It seems plausible, just like in the story. For whatever reason, Amenemhet the fourth suddenly disappeared from history. No burial tomb to speak of. Not even his ancestry is recorded. When Amenemhet the third died, his daughter Sobek Nifuru filled in where uh, the fourth, where Moshe was intended to rule. Her reign lasted only four to eight years in the she too died. Here's where, where it gets fascinating. Egypt's wealth and power reached its peak in the 12th dynasty under Amenemhet III. Without an heir, his kingdom began to fall apart. Forty years after uh, Amenemhet IV's absence, Nefer, Neferhotep suffered his kingdom to even greater losses. His military was apparently decimated. The, city, the slave city of Cahun was abandoned. And once more, Neferhotep's body was never found. Shortly after Neferhotep's drowning in the sea, uh, death, what well, actually, I don't know if it ever says he drowned in the Red Sea, but his death, Egypt was destabilized and overrun by the Hyksos. Hyksos appeared to be the biblical Amalekites, and their genealogy could be traced to Edom. Point being, Amenemhet IV went missing in Egypt. Greatest greatness had forever ended. Did Amenemhet the fourth return forty years later and finish the job? Okay. So the point was is that in history, when we're looking for the historical different kings, right? But there are where the documents in actual Nimrod, except for the Bible. The defining difference between Moshe and Pharaoh is that one is a name and the other a title. There was only one Moshe, but many pharaohs as you well know. Well, I'm beginning to think the same thing about Nimrod. He's a name, but also so much more than a name. Knowing what we do with Moshe, it shouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to figure that Nimrod went by many names. And for the writer of scripture writing, uh, as for the writer of scripture writing about him, vice versa, the, the many names were sometimes known only as one. Okay, so did you get like just one pharaoh, right? But we know there were many pharaohs. It's just pharaoh, pharaoh, pharaoh. So we all know this passage. This comes from Genesis 10. We just read this, and I'm reading from the uh, Masoretic this time, or the, the, the Hebrew. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a warrior and hunter in the earth. All right, it says Cush begat Nimrod. I take that to mean Nimrod was his name. Maybe not his birth, perhaps his mother and his grandfather and his brothers and sisters and cousins and children and grandchildren, as well as his subjects or his nurse, each called him by a different name. But this is all we have to work with at the moment, Nimrod. Well, not quite. And then we get this. This is from the Sifr Ha Yasher. 
And Nimrod dwelt in Babel, and he, he there renewed his reign over the rest of the subjects, and he reigned securely. And the subjects and princes of Nimrod called his name Amraphel, saying that our his prince fell through his name. There you have it. After the tragedy of Babel, Nimrod is given a second name, Amraphel. But then look at how the Clementine, the Clementine homily name. This comes from the recognitions of Clement, the first book, uh, probably the 30th chapter. 17th generation, Nimrod one, or I'd say Nimrod the first, reigned in Babylonia and built a city and thence migrated to the Persians and taught them to worship fire. Well, some versions just say Nimrod, while multiple others, including my with the name Nimrod the first or Nimrod one, telling us there's at least a Nimrod two somewhere down the turnpike, if not a three or four. Perhaps Nimrod one was diced by the uh, samurai-like sword skills of the Meshuzedek king of Salem, Shembar Noach, whereas Nimrod two or the third or the fourth was blindsided by Esau. I wouldn't have a clue. All right. Those multiple death scenarios will be further explored a little in a little while in my paper, which I'm not going to get that far reading tonight. But for now, I can't read something like Nimrod the first teaching the Persians to worship fire and let that pass. This ties in, by the way, with what we read tonight with Abraham being burned in the fire. I'd be letting the ball drop if I did. That's huge. Worshiping fire is an immortalization rite. The ancients would pass their children through the flames, often worship of Baal, for example. Second Chronicles when we read this, moreover, he, Akaz, burnt incense in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, or Gehenim, and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom Yahuwah had cast out before the children of Yasharel. Passing one's child through the flames in the city of the sons of Hin Hinnom isn't irony either. Another name for the valley is Gehenna, otherwise known as the lake of fire, which is, the, which is also in the heaven, uh, according to what I have concluded. You might ask yourself why I would want to toss their children into the lake of fire. They were attempting to immortalize them and potentially others, if not themselves, thereby sparing the neophyte from what is destined to come. The second death, total annihilation by fire. Notice how it is Nimrod who introduced this practice to the world. Nobody else, not even before the flood. Here's how they did it before the flood. And I've quoted from this before in this group. This comes from the book of McCain. And Lamech and Yuval the giant then sacrificed to the Leviathan and taught the sons of uh, Cain and Seth pass their children through the waters to Leviathan. So before the flood, they passed their children through the waters and right into the mouth of Leviathan, afterwards through the flames. That's because they all knew the flood waters were coming, but rather than repent of their sins, they wanted to circumnavigate Yahuwah's set apart ways by their own methods. Afterwards, the Most High had promised never to flood the world again, exchanging his judgment of fire. Alternatively, as immortal rites are concerned, it was Nimrod who connected the dots and made the transition. Fascinating. Of course, this gives us even greater context than tossing Abraham into the flames. So I'll be reading not from what we read in Genesis tonight, but this comes from the, the Ecclesiastes Targum, chapter 4. And it says, Abraham, who is the poor youth and in whom was the spirit of prophecy from Yahuwah, and to whom Yahuwah was known when three years old, and who would not worship an idol, then the wicked Nimrod, who was an old and foolish king, and because Abraham, Abraham would watch idol, he threw him into the burning furnace, and a miracle was performed for him from the Yahuwah, and he delivered him from it. And even after after this, Nimrod had no sense to be admonished not to worship the idol which he worshipped before. Seems like Nimrod was appeasing the end attached to it. Yahuwah was letting Nimrod and the subjects of his kingdom know how those immortal rights would go down in the coming judgment. Only the set apart would escape Gehenna's destruction. Old Nimrod did not have the sense to admit much notice that he was going about it all wrong. He wanted to conquer heaven as well as mortality without following the path of Shem, Bar Noah, or Abraham and the Michelle's order.
All right. right. Gilgamesh. Uh, I just read this book again last spring, uh, the Epic Gilgamesh. Uh, it's at least a and it's a uh, it's interestingly homoerotic. Uh, with so Gilgamesh for, for eighteen feet. So this king, this Gilgamesh was eighteen tall. Uh, Og was about the same, which is interesting. So we talked about before the flood. Well, it was Gilgamesh before the flood, and then look at the giants, and it's, it says. Gilgamesh speaks. I am the arm. I can vanquish anyone mortal. I made mortals in the past, but I am now not a, now able to stand against my opponents who reside in heaven. We see the same Gilgamesh. He's claiming to be uh, he can defeat any mortal, but he he's he's at war with heaven and he cannot conquer anyone in heaven. That, that's so interesting compared to the Tower of Babel. Uh, okay, and dwell in. Um, he says that he cannot. Uh, Let's see. Let me repeat that. I am not able to stand against my opponents who reside in heaven and dwell in holy places. And not only this, but they are in fact stronger than I am. The day of the ravening wild beast has come and that of the wild man as I am known. So it's interesting that he's also called here a wild man. That's kind of thing. All right. Um, let's see. So let's see. This is another... Uh, hmm. Oh, this is good. This comes from the Book of the Two Pearls again. And this comes from chapter one, one chapter prior. And this is, this is what it says. In those days and afterwards, the Elohim, uh, the gods, were tempted by Nakash. Nakash is uh, uh, the destroyer of the earth. They were tempted by Nakash to look after the women of the earth. So Nakash is just another name for Hasatan. The women bore titanic children, uh, like the Titans. This is the Titans. Titanic these Elohim, which are called fillers. They also taught men to mix species of animals and to mix forbidden races of the heathen. That's interesting. So Elohim flooded the inhabited land and destroyed all of the corruption therein. The Elohim were chained forever, but their offspring became shades, like phantoms or demons, called the phantoms of fear. All right. And then we read this in the book of Enoch, chapter 15. Just in case you guys are curious, I'm building a case here. By now, the Nephilim, who have been born of the Ruach, shall be called upon earth evil Ruach, evil spirits or demons. And on earth shall be their habitation. Evil Ruach shall proceed from their flesh because they were created from above. From the holy watchers was their beginning and primary foundation. Evil Ruach shall they be upon earth. And the Ruachoth of the wicked shall they be called. The habitation of the Ruachoth of heaven shall be in heaven, but upon earth shall be the habitation of terrestrial Ruach who are born on earth. The Ruach of the Nephilim are like clouds, which shall oppress, corrupt, fall, content, and bruise upon earth. They shall cause lamentation. No food shall they eat, and they shall be thirsty. They shall be condemned and shall rise up against the men and against the women. For they came forth during the days of slaughter and destruction. So the pre-Diluvian giants, sons of the watchers, still rule over the earth. Kind of makes you wonder who Gilgamesh possessed. Let me say that again. If Gilgamesh was a giant, and he was killed off. And a Gilgamesh and Nimrod were the person for the... Okay. My, my point I want to develop here is what if this Nimrod is a Nimrod? Okay, and Rama talked about this before um, before he died. It was one of his big flat earth. And this comes from the Bible too. It says that Nimrod would be resurrected. So my whole point here is what if there were multiple lives of Nimrod? Okay, Nimrod existed before the flood. He existed after the flood. It said he became a mighty man. And I just wonder if maybe he was, uh, it, you know, he was inhabited by the spirit of Nimrod. I don't really know. But then it's interesting that the whole obelisk culture, which we get from um, the mysteries of Isis, but according to this, it originated in Nimrod, and Ham would have stole it from Babylon and taken it to Egypt. Um, you know, just tells us about his, uh, his, I guess, recycling. I mean, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, what, if, what about the spirit of Og? I would think that he would still be alive today, right? That's kind of an interesting thought. I shouldn't say frightening thought because I'm not frightened of them, but 
And uh, that should hopefully give you all guys something to ponder and think about. And if you guys like what I read, then maybe I'll finish the paper because I have tons of more notes on this and just try to connect this idea that uh, Nimrod um, may have been a god on the earth. I mean, a, truly a my man who was worshipped by these people for a reason. Uh, maybe he came back during their lifetime. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Michael. Thank you for being patient, Michael. Oh, no worries. Great stuff. Yeah, and please read more because I still have a lot. So I'll split mine up. Um, chapter 11. So I'm only on chapter 11, starting on verse 1 now. It says that, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And you look at the Jerusalem Targum. Those who aren't following on, I think I should uh, post that. So <laughs> all the inhabitants of the earth were of one language and of one speech and one council. They spake the holy language by which the world was created at the beginning, while their, while their hearts erred afterwards from the word of him who spake and the world was at the beginning. That holy language. Okay, so... Okay, so in the biblical, this is a commentary, in the biblical introduction of the Tower of Babel account in Genesis 11, 1, it is said that everyone on earth spoke the same language. But this is inconsistent with the biblical description of the post noahic world described in Genesis 10, 5, where it is said that the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth gave rise to different nations, each with their own language. And so, you know, a lot of people will say that. Uh, the commentary is saying there's no contradiction here. Moses merely put the effect before the cause. Gen Genesis 10 gives an overview, and then Genesis 11 fills in the details. You often find the same technique in other history books. One might contain an overview of World War I, along with a list of major events, but the very next chapter might detail what the world was like in the years before the war and what events led up to it. So I know that's if we're trying to be an apologetic. I've even heard it from people within Israel <laughs> that actually believed it. They were questioning that. But uh, what do you guys make about that? Number two, it says, And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And Jerusalem, and they found a plain in the land of Pontos and dwelt there. I didn't get on the rabbit trail of Pontos, but there was a lot. There was a lot. So you can do P-O-N-T-O-S if you want to research that. So Shinar. Shinar is mentioned a total of eight times in the Bible. So Joshua 7, 20. 20 and 21. So Achan, A C H A O N, answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did when I saw among the spoils a beautiful robe from Shinar. So he sinned in taking a Shinarish garment as forbidden loot in the destruction of Ai. So um, the other times, four Genesis verses all refers to Shinar as the place where the Tower of Babel was built. Isaiah 11.11 11 is a reference to the gathering of the children of Israel from far places, including Shinar. Zechariah 5.11 sees a vision in which an angel tells him that a house for the ephah will be built in the land of Shinar. And then Daniel um, talks about Shinar as well, but that's up for discussion. There's a lot of different takes on that, so I just wanted to mention that. Shinar is mentioned eight times. Um, I'm going to post this decently written article here. Um, this is more on the names of Shiner. What, what does it mean? Um, summarizing, um, it could be, mean date palm. It could mean to shake out. It could mean to light of glowing fire. It could also mean land of the regenerator. And then I like this one. It says that Shiner is simply a Semitic language form of two rivers. In Hebrew, Shana and Nahar. So Shinar then would be land of two rivers, a name closely related in meaning to the Greek Mesopotamia. We would therefore look for Shinar somewhere in a territory that includes two rivers. I personally thought that was the best one, but feel free to, to read the article. Um, so, and this is where the thunder was taken uh, with Amraphel. So Noel was talking about King Amraphel. Um, we'll get to it in a few chapters, but he ruled Shinar in Genesis 14. So, um, but several Judaic, early Judaic sources also assert that King Amaral, Amraphel, who wars with Abraham later in Genesis, is none other than Nimrod himself. So again, Nin Noel did a great job as far as being Nimrod a title or a spirit. 
I can see all of it. I can also see it be like an actual person who might be resurrected, but it could be in the spirit. John came in in the spirit of Elijah. Will there be someone in the spirit of Nimrod? It's possible. So he was king of Shinar, Hebrew for Sumer. He invaded Canaan along with other kings under the leadership of Cherdulomar, king of Elam. Uh, so he dwelt in Babel, and there. So Nimrod dwelt in Babel, and there he re renewed his reign over the rest of his subjects. And he reigned securely in the subjects of the princes of Nimrod, called his name Amraphel. So that's the Sefer Hayashar, which uh, Noel read as well. So I thought that was interesting. Is is was Nimrod Amraphel, or again spirit of Nimrod? The Book of Jubilees on Shinar um, talks about. And, and for Asher came forth the second portion, all the land of Asher and Nineveh and Shinar and to the border of India, and then ascends and skirts the river. So again, they're dividing, Ham's dividing his his portion to his sons. Um, yeah, and so Jubilees 10 talks about that the Tower of Babel was built with bitumen from the Sea of Shinar, the Sea of Shinar. So this scholar named David Roll theorized that the tower was actually, and this is pretty well known, was actually located in Eridu, which was once located on the coast of the Persian Gulf, where there are ruins of a massive ancient ziggurat worked, worked from bitumen. So a lot of people will claim it's, it was a ziggurat. This guy was saying it's on the coast of the Persian Gulf. Um, and finally on this verse, the word east. So it said, let's see what it said. Um, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east. So the word east is intentionally alluded to in scriptures to let us know that a person or group is moving contrary to Yah's will. So in the Genesis narratives, when a man goes east, he leaves the land of the blessing and goes to a land where the greatest of his hopes will turn to ruin, Babylon and Sodom. So you don't want to do that. Um, KGV says, number three, and they said one to another, go, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. So, I noticed a lot during the study the similarities between Babel and Israel enslaved in Egypt. And so this is the first of a few. It says, let's see, the Torah records bricks were used in two, only in two regards, Babel and the building of Egypt by the Israelites. As the Israelites were enslaved, so too were the people of Babel. As the people of Babel received no pay for their service, so too were the Israelites deprived of their pay. And then you can see this little connection here. Genesis 11, 1, come let us. Egypt 1, 10, come let us. Build us a city, build cities, scattered abroad, burst forth. Bricks for stone and slime, had they for mortar, bricks and mortar. Again, very similar. Um, this is the, I'm going to be talking about Exodus 5 on a word study, but this is a summary on Exodus 5. Um, so they they didn't so Moses and Aaron didn't ask for freedom. They requested that Pharaoh allow them three days out of Egypt so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. So they were trying to do a feast. Pharaoh said he did not know who the Lord was and that he will not allow them to make sacrifices since he did not want them to obey someone who he knew nothing about. So he got angry with them. He thought they just wanted to take people away from their work, their slave job. He told them that they were numerous and all of them had work to do. They tried to reason with them. Um, they even said, if you don't let us, God will strike you with a plague. Pharaoh still refused. He informed his guards or slave, and the slave drivers that the quota of bricks would remain the same, but the Israelites will no longer receive straw. So they were actually funding the straw, but this, they passed that. And that now Israel had to go get their own straw in addition to keeping the same quota of bricks. So the overseers tried to reason with Pharaoh, but he only told them that they were lazy and that they needed to get back to work. Um, yeah, so back to the original verse. So it says, and they said one to another, go, let us make brick. And so that word brick was used in Exodus 5, 15, starting. The foreman of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh saying, why do you deal with this way with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants. Yet they, are, they keep saying to us, make bricks. And behold, your servants are beating, being beaten, but it is the fault of your own people. But he said, you are lazy, very lazy. Therefore you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. So go now and work, for you will be given no straw, yet you must deliver the quota of bricks. So this word bricks is the same word in Babel, where they were making bricks. 
um, both slaves, both, as we've talked about, some are God's people. They're set apart. And if you read Jasher on this account, we'll get to this eventually, the, the Levites did not do this. They were not slaves under Pharaoh. They were set apart. And so we re also read about Abraham and Lot not building the tower. There's always a set apart. Uh, I have more on the Exodus in a little bit, but uh, number four, it says, uh, and they said, go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And just want to show the difference. Oh man, you can't see this. Hopefully you can blow that up. But uh, Palestinian and Jerusalem talk about we will make us an image for worship on top of it and put a sword in his hand to act against the array of war. And Jerusalem says, we will make us in a house of worship. They're trying to worship up there, not just reach and put a sword in his hand. Um, number seven, it says, and this is where Josh pointed out earlier, go to, let us go down and therefore confound their language that they may not understand one speech. Palestinian. I'll, I'll add this for those who don't have the link. These are good stuff. Said to the 70 angels which stand before him, Come, we will descend, and we will therefore commingle their language, that a man shall not understand the speech of his neighbor. And the word of the Lord was re revealed against the city, and with him 70 angels, having to reference the 70 nations. Praise God, Palestinian. Uh, let's see, where do I want to stop? Okay, so I'll do one more and then hand it off to Noel. Then let's see. Number eight says, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. And so, so they scattered them to build the city, they left to build the city. Palestinian says, And he dispersed them from thence upon the face of all the earth into 70 languages. And one knew not what his neighbor would say, but one slew the other, and they ceased from building the city. All right, the last thing I'm going to say is another parallel to Exodus 5. Um, that word scattered. So the, so the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I'm not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but none of the labor will be reduced. So the people scattered through all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. Taskmasters pressed them, saying, Complete your work quota, your daily amount, just as when you get the straw. So the Lord scattered them after the Tower of Babel and the people scattered because, you know, these people were still doing what Pharaoh wanted them to do. I don't know. I don't know what to make of that, but there's something there. Still have a little bit left, but I'll hand it off to know. So I have a couple more points that I'm going to make tonight. I'll be splitting this up, of course. And, and this, this one here, I'll be starting off on chapter 11. And I want to make, point out the idea that there is a holy language in heaven all right now unfortunately i'll be step, stepping on some toes that's not my intent guys i'm just speaking i'm just a guy speaking my opinion based on my research uh, but we hear in today's culture very recently in history about this um a another type of language from heaven called tongues and i can't find that anywhere in scripture but what i do find is that there is a tongues from heaven and it is the Hebrew language, all right? And so we're seeing that right here in Genesis 11, 1. Uh, all the earth was of one language and one speech and one counsel, all right? And it says, it gives you the clue. It says, in the holy language they spake. So there is a holy language, which I would assume, at least here, that this is the language of heaven. Uh, that by which the world had been created at the beginning, all right? So there's, there's your next clue. Uh, my assumption is correct that whatever language the word spoke at the beginning, uh, it was this same language that all of humanity spake before the flood, after the flood. I went over in the first week of this Targum series, the Aleph, the Aleph and the Tav, how it's actually embedded in the first, uh, the first sentence of Bir Sheath of Genesis, and translators don't know what to do with it, and they just leave it out. And the Sephiroth has actually added it in, interestingly enough. It seems to be stating that Yahuwah created the alphabets, the Hebrew alphabets, and then from that he was able to speak the world into existence. He could not have sp spoken the world into existence if there was no alphabet. 
that's simple logic. Well, let's read what it says in Jubilees 342. And on that day, uh, this is on the day that uh, uh, Adam and Hava uh, sent. So, and on that day was closed the mouth of all beasts and of cattle and of birds and of whatever walketh and of whatever moveth so that they could no longer speak. Bummer. For they had all spoken one with another with one lip and with one tongue. So these animals all spoke the same language as humanity. And it, oh man, that makes so much sense. Like, has anybody here, I can't speak for the, for cats out there because I've never really been around cats, but if you have been around dogs, dogs are fascinating because they can understand what we're saying and they could, uh, you know, they, they'll turn their head and their ears and they're listening and they'll, we say sit, they, they sit, right? You guys know this, they, you, just, you can bark commands at them and they'll do it, but they can't speak back. They can't communicate back. And this was the confusion of tongues. So Babel was the second confusion of tongues. The first confusion happened at, with Eden, with the sin of Adam and Hava. And it's like dogs and other, other animals, they want to speak with us, but they're incapable. I just think that's a, uh, the idea that, that a day is coming when they can speak with us again. I, I really look forward to that. Well, let's read a little bit further in Jubilees, see what it says. This comes from chapter 12. And Yahuwah Elohim said, though this is speaking about Abraham, open his mouth and his ears that he may hear and speak with his mouth with the language which hath been revealed. For it had ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the day of the overthrow of Babel. And I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips, and I began to speak with him in Hebrew, in the tongue of the creation. And there's the word tongue, right? Speaking in tongues of heaven is Hebrew. And he took the books of his father's and these were written in Hebrew, and he transcribed them, and he began from henceforth to study them. And I made known to him that which he could not understand, and he studied them during the six rainy months. All right, so that comes to Jubilees chapter 12. All right, so Hebrew was the language originally spoken by all animals and man, and is the language of heaven. We've established that. There is, there is not a tongues language in heaven that is not Hebrew. The original language uh, was Hebrew, just as surely as the tongues of angels is Hebrew. So when Paul is talking about the tongues of angels, he has to be talking about Hebrew because there's no other tongues of angels. So if the Ruach HaKadosh or an angel is speaking to us in a language other than Hebrew, if it is in English or Swahili or Pidgin or Farsi or Coptic or Greek or Latin or Russian or French or blah, 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 you know, just fill in the blank, Spanish, good on the list, not forgetting a babbling tongue. It is not the language of heaven. I just want to make that clear. One of the reasons why Yah confounded the tongues is because of what Nimrod was doing when it, uh, with it. He was doing something magical. Was it Kabbalah? Not really sure. Uh, might have been resembling it very much. It's, but it's called in the writings of Abraham, the secret combination. And this is, I've quoted a lot from the writings of Abraham. I'm always trying to stop myself from quoting from this book, but I can't help it. It's so incredible. I love this book to death. And this is what it says in chapter two. I, Abraham, was born the son of Terah, who was prime minister to Nimrod, who reigned in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now this Nimrod was a wicked man and an idolater, and my father Terah was led to follow after his abominations. Moreover, Nimrod was a man of mighty power, for he was Master Mahan. So there we go. The um, Michael had talked about Nimrod being a the uh the like the founder of Freemasonry or, or a Freemason. I think Cain was the founder, but he's he's carrying on the traditions of Cain. He's the master Mahan. Now he's the top dog, and had in his hands the secrets of the ancients. So this would go back to the Cain, uh, the sons of Cain, as they had come down from Cain wherein he knew the words of power and the signs for using them. And he had the holy garments, which he had been given unto Adam in the garden, in which was great power. And so we read about that in Jasher as well, that he's actually wearing the, the garments. Uh, the, the, what we saw in the Aramaic Targum earlier was actually the shed skin of Hasatan or the serpent. And he's wearing the serpent skin. All of this power did Nimrod use to get gain after the manner of the secret combination. 
With his power, he had set out to build a tower which would reach to heaven. So he's using his power, this Hebrew tongue, to actually build the tower. And you can, you can again see why Yahuwah is now uh, destroying the, the language. Which would reach to heaven, even the city of my father Enoch, which had been taken up, that he, Nimrod, might uh, depose Elohim from his throne, for Elohim had taken up his abode among the people of Enoch. And might have just also explained, too, that this is why I believe, and I, Pam, Miss Pamela is in the, the room as well, and she, I think she agrees with me, that this is probably a huge reason why a modern Hebrew is not Paleo-Hebrew. That somewhere down the line, by the time of Ezra, um, Yahuwah basically hid the Hebrew language. And uh, it is not spoken anymore. It was uh, it was a new language that was created, and I I just think that I I think that Yahuwah wants to uh, guard what is personal to him. He doesn't want to see this kind of stuff happening with something that is uh, set, supposed to be set apart. But Elohim frustrated the plans of Nimrod by confounding the language of him and his people that they could no longer render the sacred words, and they scattered forth over the face of the earth. At that time, Nimrod came and established the city of Ur, which is the city of light. I find that so fascinating. It's called the city of light. For he yet retained his determination to build a city to rival the city of Elohim, that the light and power might center in him. So he's actually trying to rival New Jerusalem. He's trying to build something that rivals it. And that, that's what I'll be talking about in my next note. I, I believe we can find where um, the Tower of Babel is, and it's, uh, it's massive. And though the ministration of Satan and through the ministration of Satan, he did receive again some of the words of power and did recognize the secret combination among his people, but he had not power as at the first for the fullness of the pure language was not restored to him. So he was never able to uh, speak Hebrew language in its fullness again. Now, this is another interesting point. Uh, I'm going to be skipping some of this in Jasher because I wanted to establish. I'll just tell you guys the reference. You can look it up, Josh, for li for lack of time. Jasher chapter 48 and 49 talks about Joseph, and and he's going to meet Pharaoh to talk about the dream, and this gets into the the seven years of plenty and the seven years of want, and he's going to define uh, interpret the dream for him. And he there's 70 steps. And that represents the 70 different languages on the earth. And Joseph is actually taught these 70 tongues by an angel who is during the night, who is he's able to miraculously speak these 70 languages and he's able to ascend up all 70 steps. And it's like, it's a miracle. Um, so that's just the idea of a, of a tongue in Hebrew. And I bring all this up because I'm hoping that as people come over to the Torah and they start reading this and investigating this stuff that they can kind of see from a, we kind of have to let some of the baggage go that we've come into this, that we're emotionally clinging to and our experiences that actually, I think the Bible says very different things about what a tongue is than what we have been taught in the mainstream church. And I'm, I'm trying to say this as gently as possible. All right. So uh, now we get to, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the, the importance of the Hebrew language in, in the world and how it was never maybe fully reconstructed as it once was, except through Abraham and the set-apart people. So uh, we, we see here an interesting event in Genesis 11, and Michael commented on the 70. And uh, it, so notice the order of events. Yahuwah knows of the reports of the Tower of Babel going up, Okay. There's actually a passage in Enoch, which I'm not going to quote from, but the, the angels come to Yahuwah and they're really frustrated with them because they're like, they look down at the earth and they see this evil going on. They see what the watchers are doing, these giants. And they're like, what? they tell Yahuwah, they, they like, why don't you tell us about any, we know you know everything. So why are you not telling us what's going on? All right. So here we see that Yahuwah knows what's going on. And he then brings his divine counsel together in heaven and presents to them what is happening. He discloses it. He's like, okay, guys, they're building this tower and they're, they're going to come up here and try to kill us. They presumably, um, they presumably here discuss the situation, right? It's his counsel for a reason. His counsel is telling the Yahuwah the Most High what they think should be done. But it is Yahuwah who does something about it. In all these instances where we see him bring the councils together, he then, whatever decision is made, whether it's his decision or whatever, he then follows through with it. But here it's really interesting that it is the word 
who was revealed against the city. And with him came the 70 angels. So it's actually here Yahusha who seems to be the one who is revealed against the um, the tower. And I don't know if he appeared in the sky. I, I don't know. Like It, it might have been like a serious judgment where they see him coming down and, you know, and, and it's it's toppled over. These 70 angels are the ones who inherit the 70 nations and each with their own language. And which I find interesting because these Elohim no longer are speaking the language of heaven. Think about that. Okay. So if, if Hebrew is the language of heaven, these Elohim are no longer speaking it. And you would assume these 70 angels love you who in his Torah, but that's not what happens. So are these, are these Elohim, are they good Elohim or bad Elohim? Are they good angels or bad angels? And at what time did they, at what point did they turn? Have they already been corrupted before then? Why are they in counsel of the Most High? Those are questions I have, and they're excellent ones to seek out, for anyone to seek out. And you later get on, get on to a psalm, was it 82, 81, 82, where uh, Yahuwah is, is telling them, like, look, you're not teaching them my Torah. You're going to die like men, right? So it was always Yahuwah's intent for them to learn his Torah, but they weren't interested in teaching it. Very interesting. Well, then I, I talked to this about this last week a little bit, and I mentioned a guy named, um, let's see, what is his name? Okay, this na guy named Phineas Farsa. And he was a, a, you can look him up on Wikipedia, he has an article on there. He, he apparently was the son, a son of Magog. And his story furthermore pits him at the construction of Nimrod's tower. He was one of the 72 chieftains who played foreman there. So there we have the number 72 instead of 70. That's interesting. And what's most interesting about him is that afterwards he claimed to have attempted to reunite the confused tongue, something Nimrod tried to do. And he tried as well. And he tried to create one universal language. And according to some of the archives in Ireland and other places, I know this is the Irish telling the story, uh, that the, the, the Celtic language of the Gaelic or the Gaelic Celts um, is his attempt to reconstruct Hebrew, which is, again, interesting because there's a lot of commonalities. So that's just a little interesting side note. Now, here's the thing I want to end on before sending it back to Michael. There's a few passages that seem to imply that during the millennial kingdom, that Hebrew would be the language of heaven would be the tongues that are spoken. And now I, for one, believe that during the millennial kingdom, there were uh, people who I, th I think that people generally spoke Hebrew, but I also think that they spoke in their own native tongues. And I think that that's important too for him being king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, so this is what it says in Zephaniah 3 8, if I can find it. Um, oh, let's see. Oh, maybe it's Zephaniah 3 9. Okay. For then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they will all call upon the name of Yahuwah to serve him with one consent. And there's an important reason. If you want to, um, it straight out says that, that calling on his name in the pure language, that's important. So, you know, for those who argue that, you know, it's not, well, there you go. There's one passage right there. It's important to Yahuwah that we call on his name in his holy language. And then we read this in Isaiah 19.18. In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan. And swear to Yahuwah of hosts. Wasn't well, that interesting? Because you know, people will point out that the language of Canaan was Hebrew. And they'll claim that Abraham stole it from them. And I say vice versa. I say the, the language of Canaan actually took it from Abraham. But here you see that the language of Canaan, according to Isaiah, was the Hebrew language. All right. And I'm going to have back over to Michael. And then I'll have my closing arguments for the night. Awesome. I will close my, my part out as well. Um, number nine, it says, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did confound the language of all the earth. From de thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So a lot of people know Babel means confusion in Hebrew, but in Babylonian, it means the gate of the gods. What do you think about that? Um, I'm going to add another comment here <laughs> or a picture. Look at the difference between the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 and the Pentecost in Acts 2. So, confusion of tongues, reversal of Babel, tongues are understood. 
Yah scattered the people of judgment to the four corners of the earth. People will scatter to spread the gospel. Um, language is used to pr promote a human agenda. Let us make a name for ourselves. Language is used as a sign to announce the works. Uh, disunity and unity. Pretty cool. Um, Josephus, everyone's favorite, on Nimrod. So he states, uh, let's see. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man in great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was in their own courage which procured that happiness, pride. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. Sounds familiar? Now it says, now the multitude, the multitude, not the set apart, were ready to follow the determination of Nimrod and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. This is happening now. And they built the tower, neither sparing any pains, nor being in any degree negligent about the work. And by reason of the multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high, sooner than anyone could expect. But the thickness of it was so great and was so strongly built that thereby its great height seemed upon the view to be less than it really was. It was built of burnt brick, cemented together with a mortar, made of bitumen, that it might not be liable to emit water. Because they, you know, they, even though Yas said he wasn't going to flood, they still had that, because it probably killed a lot of their, you know, their genes. But uh, when God saw that they acted so madly, he did not resolve to destroy them utterly, since they were not grown wiser by the destruction of their former sinners in the flood. So I just, again, just want to point out that it's the multitude who follows Nimrod. It's the multitude. We are set apart. We are different. How, how do we define ourselves different? It's, it's his Torah. It's being different from the world. It's set apart. We are only sojourners. Okay, third apocalypse of Baruch. So in this account, Baruch is first taken in a vision to see the resting place of the souls of those who built the tower of strife against God and the Lord banished them. Next, he is shown another place and they're occupying the form of dogs. The form of dogs. So let's see what it says here. It says counsel to build the tower from whom thou seest drove forth multitudes of both men and women to make bricks among whom a woman making bricks was not allowed to be released in the hour of her childbirth but brought forth child while she was making bricks and carried her child in her apron and continued to make bricks wow this, for me this you know just babylon guys yeah, babylon <laughs> uh come out of her Come out of her. Um, here's another one. Quotation from the Sibyl is from the Sibylline Oracles. Um, but when the threatenings of the mighty God are fulfilled, which he threatened mortals once, when in the Assyrian land they built a tower, 120, to mount aloft into the starry heaven, but on the air the immortal straightway put forth a mighty force, and then winds from above cast down the great tower and stirred mortals up. Oh, 120 is the verse, jeez. <laughs> to wrangling with each other. Therefore men gave to that city the name of Babylon. Now when the tower fell and the tongues of men turned to all sorts of sounds, straightway all the earth was filled with men and kingdoms were divided. So that's just their take. So now I want to talk about the height. And we'll talk about that. Yeah, no, no more time to believe for you. That's funny. Um, the Tower of Babel. Um, so this guy did some math here. Um, with Baith equals 30 stadies times 30 stadies. Now you may ask, what is a stade? 13 stadies equals 2.34 kil kilometers, or one and a half miles wide. 30 stadies equals 5.4 kilometers, or 3.4 miles long. So the base of the tower was one and a half miles wide, 3.4 miles long. The height of the tower equals 1.6 miles high, three times taller than the tallest building. And let me throw some more here. So this is... Quick search of the tallest building. And how it's only 0.5 miles high. Uh, that is about three times high. This was the tallest building. This was 2010 in Dubai. Um, this is the feet equals this many miles. So what they're saying is this was three times that. Crazy. Um, only have two left, and then I'll be done for the night. So number 27 
Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah beget Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran beget Lot. The only thing I'm pointing out is the difference in Palestinian. So it talks about the generations, but then it says, and it was when Nimrod had cast Abram, and I think Noel did talk about this, into the furnace of fire, because he would not worship his idol, and the fire had no power to burn him, that Haran's heart became doubtful, saying, if Nimrod overcame, I will be on his side. But if, Im if Abraham overcame, I will be on his side. When all the people who, who were there saw that the fire had no power over Abraham, they said in their hearts, Is not Haran the brother of Abraham full of divinations and charms? And has he not uttered spells over the fire that should not burn his brother? Immediately there fell fire from the high heavens and consumed him. Way different, huh? What do you guys make about that? I know there's other books that talk about that story, I believe. Maybe it's Joshua. And then finally, number 28, and Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in the Uro Chaldees. So, Palestinian. Haran died in the sight of Terah's father where he was burned in the land of his nativity in the furnace of fire which the Kazda had made for Abraham, his brother. So, it's an interesting two chapters. This is what I had. I'll hand it back off to Noel. So, the idea is, is that the Tower of Babel was massive. I believe in, I think Michael had mentioned this earlier, but I think it's in Jasher, and I, I, I might have this in my notes. It talked about how it was a three-day journey to walk around. Three days, guys. That's, that's massive. So what do we, I mean, we're talking here, it's like a 60-mile circumference, maybe. That's huge. So I would think that uh, this tower, even though it's destroyed, you would still see some evidence for it somewhere. I, I would presume so. I mean, uh, we apparently have Mount Sinai. We apparently have the Ark. We apparently have uh, the Red Sea crossing and all these locations. We apparently have Sodom and Gomorrah and you name it. You go down the list. So why don't we have the Tower of Babel? Well, I think we do. So imagine if you're, you're walking east from uh, Yasharel and you, you walk through the Jordan. And you keep going further east. You walk to Iraq and keep walking further east. You walk to Iran. You're not there yet. You keep walking further east. You keep you walk to Afghanistan or Pakistan. You're not there yet. You kind of keep walking further east. And I think this is one of the problems is that many people are looking for the tower in the Iran area of the world, uh, maybe even the Iraq area of the world. And the plains of Shinar, I believe, are – see, that's one of the things – uh, we really don't know where the plains of Shinar are. And uh, I know that there has been maybe claims made, whatever, but I think that it can be found. And I think you have to keep walking uh, towards the Himalayan mountains and get past Nepal, just north of India, and you get to Tibet. And I'm going to be putting forward the idea that Mount Kailash is the Tower of Babel. It's actually quite fascinating. And I'm going to put a picture in here. Right here, this is what I'm going to propose is the Tower of Babel. And just so you guys know, I'm give credit where it's due. I would love to write an article on this. I've been wanting to for years. But someone by the name of Benjamin Turner put out some fascinating research on this. And um, I'm kind of going off some of his research. And uh, I've spoken with him on the phone over this. He's just a great guy, uh, loves Yahuwah, Torah observance, and his whole household. So the land where Mount Kailash is located is Tibet, and it just so happens to be the disputed quote-unquote autonomous region between India and China of all places, and uh, has been fought over for many years. And it's also important, this mountain, to four Eastern religions, to Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Bon. So that's interesting. When the, I, let's see. So uh, let's see here. And this is what it says in Jasher 9.23, and all the families assembled consisting of about 600,000 men. It's a lot of men. This is not the women and children. And they went to seek a wide piece of ground to build the city and the tower. So there are 600,000 men that are taking part in this building project. How many men did it take to build those uh, skyscrapers like in Dubai and New York City and wherever the other tall it's probably, you know, I'm sure Singapore probably has some big ones. 600,000 men searched for the perfect place for this utopian city that could reach towards the heavens. And we read this in Jasher 9, and they searched in the whole earth 
Now, keep in mind that, you know, the inheritances are being brought about and they're, they're going around and Nimrod's idea is to unify the world, right? So he's gathering people probably from all groups, from Ham, from Japheth, from Shem. And he's like, all right, let's, you know, let's scout out the perfect location. And they found nothing like one flat place east of the land of Shinar, about two days walk. And they journeyed there and they dwelt there and they began to make bricks and burn fires to build the city and the tower that they had imagined to complete. Now, what I don't have prepared now that I think about it is to show how this uh, mountain here is actually about a two days walk from the plains of Sh from a huge plain that would be the plains of Shinar. And keep in mind at this time that um, that this mountain would have been part of uh, a flat surface as well. So, all right. And the question is, is, is Mount Kailash the remains of the tower? I don't think this is a uh, leap of logic at all, con considering we're looking at all these like burnt, melted cities and, you know, other landmarks all around the world that was probably part of cities. And it, if you look closely at this mountain, it looks burnt, it looks scorched. So let's see. Um, let's see what else it says in Jasher 938. As to the tower which the sons of men built, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up one third part of it. And fire also descended from heaven and burned another third. And the other third is left to this day. And it is of that part which was aloft. So according to Jasher, one third of this massive tower should remain somewhere on this earth to this day, at least when Jasher was written. People could go there. They knew what it was and they would go and visit it. All right. So let me show you this other picture here of the same mountain. So you could see here where it slopes down, and that may be the mouth of the earth that swallowed it, all right, sinking one-third of the tower to the ground. You can't, from the, the plane picture I showed you, you can't see all this, this detail. And then you can also look and see what may be ash and brick cascading down the sides, all right, as one-third of the tower was incinerated with fire. All right, here's another picture here. Same mountain, could these be extremely large red bricks that were left over? And if you look at this picture that I'm about to put up, yet another angle of this of this uh, massive mountain, it's almost as if there are stairs in the in the center of the structure. And so I think what they were doing was, is I think I think maybe the base just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like they didn't know how high it was to get to heaven. And so they're like, we're just going to keep building this sucker out. And we're just going to keep building and building and building and building higher and higher and higher. And they would just, you know, build staircases on the outside. All right. Let's see. Here's another picture. I can put this in here. What we see today as a mountain may be the inner brick brickwork of the tower, sunken down to a similar height as the surrounding mountains preserved today um, to show us what Yahuwah did. All right. So this is a... Uh, this is described in multiple religions, as I said, as a holy mountain. Um, and um, this is what in in let's see here in Hinduism. Oh, here's a picture of the here's a picture here of the same mountain in Hinduism, and they depict God residing inside of the mountain, uh, as if it was a building with chambers inside. I find that really interesting, and as well. That takes me back to um, to Mithras, the the Elohim Mithras, and he's always depicted as being birthed coming out of a mountain. He's coming through a mountain and conquering heaven. So I think that's really interesting as well. And let's see what else do I have here. I have quite a few stuff, but uh, three. So we see that the in Jasher nine it says, and its circumference is three days walk. Uh, many people of the sons of men died in that tower, a people without number. Well, we know that trekking this mountain is exactly three days. And this is according to Wikipedia. It says that. So that's a shame. So we have a really gr great uh, close contender there. And uh, I think that's about it, but something to consider. So I think we have evidence that that is the uh, Tower of Babel. It still remains. And I think they're hiding that from us. And I have a lot of stuff I wanted to talk on more scripture I was going to read on the fire, but I think the point is made, and I think it would just be uh, hammering out by this point that the there's a contrast being made between Abraham, what, between Nimrod worshiping fire and Abraham being thrown into the fire, 
and the gods of his father being burnt down uh, because all the gods can be thrown in the fire. All people are going to be thrown in the fire. Nimrod eventually will be thrown in the fire. But the, they were not able to destroy Abraham in the fire because Yah is saying, look, if, if, you want to, if you want to escape the burning flames, serve me. You could, you're, this is the only way to do it. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And Michael, did you have anything more you wanted to add? No, sir. That was great. All right. So I hope you guys enjoyed that tonight. And um, yeah, I'm going to officially close Michael and my part. And uh, opening up to the floor, you guys can give your thoughts, any observations you had that we missed, any thoughts. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I, 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 love, uh, I love this group. I love seeing you guys. I love seeing the new people, the old people returning. And uh, let me know your thoughts. Nimrod's such a big chapter. You guys have anything? Rebecca looks like she's saying something. Oh, that was really fascinating. And I, I just wanted to know what you know about... I, was it Rob Skiba who said that uh, when they in, when we invaded Baghdad, uh, that we went to the museum and took a lot of stuff, including supposedly the preserved head of Nimrod, for the purpose of resurrecting him yet again? It sounds like I, I found that I had no idea that he might have, or there might have been three versions of Nimrod. I find all that very interesting, and I wondered. Uh, if you know anything about uh, Baghdad supposedly having his head. Well, does, uh, does anyone here in the room want to comment on that? If not, that's okay. I will say that I think it's interesting that I, there is a lot of, you know, claims on that. And that's definitely one of Rob Skiba's big talking points. And I do think it's interesting that if, Nimrod would have been preserved in these wastelands of Babylon um, through the millennial kingdom. And you come out the other ends and, um, you know, people start developing there, building there. Uh, and all of a sudden it springs up and, you know, the, in the very places where Yahuwah told us not to go. So I, I don't really have an opinion on that because obviously I wasn't there. I, I don't know if they did or they didn't. There is that really interesting video floating around. I can't find it anymore. It's a really rare video. Some of you guys might know what I'm talking about, but it was supposedly taken around the time of the Iraq invasion. And there is a an eerie looking body uh, in a casket with a long beard and he's perfectly preserved. And we don't know who this person is. He's apparently a very preserved old king. And um, they're all like standing around staring at him. I don't know if it's it's Nimrod or somebody else. Uh, some of you might know what I'm talking about. I was trying to find it tonight to show it to the group. And I, I, I can't. I don't know where it is. I remember. Um, I remember uh, hearing something from Rob, maybe that. Uh, that they they had they they were looking for Nimrod to kind of start the whole like in the days of Noah because Nimrod had he'd found the tech the technology or he'd found the way to become a mighty man just like you know just like the giants in the time of Noah and that they were essentially what they were trying to do was they were trying to bring back the DNA corrupt the DNA um, so that the days of Noah would return and that there would be giants and kind of these half people, half creatures. Um, and that was just, he, he was speculating that it would happen with, I think with some kind of uh, jab or, you know, injection or something like this and it would be widespread. And I think, I think there was a significant amount of speculation kind of put forth that it could have something to do with the, um, you know, with the cookies, um, being having a having either that kind of DNA altering kind of capacity or being like actual like cloned blood from uh, Nimrod in that. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, in a nutshell, I think that is pretty much uh, Skiba's presentation. And uh, I Katie here found I think that's the video. So you guys check it out. It's really. Whoever, whoever that is, I don't know if that's Nimrod. I don't know if that's Gilgamesh. I don't know who that is. It's pretty creepy. 
And uh, I was going to say something, and but I think somebody else has somebody else wants to speak. Anybody else? There was somebody else here. Oh, I was going to say that uh, Josh was uh, joking about uh, going and climbing that mountain, and. I will say that another interesting thing about this mountain is that it's highly protected by the government. And I don't think that anybody can just go climbing up on those mountains uh, unless you want to face the people with the guns. So to me, it's, it, it feels like, I mean, there's something about that location there that they don't want people digging around inspecting. They don't want the archaeologists showing up. I think that there's something to be said about it. Well, according to the legends of the Jews, uh, it says almost exactly the same thing that you quoted in Jasher, except it adds a bit at the end, which is um, that the place of the tower has never lost its peculiar, I can't talk tonight, peculiar quality. Whoever passes it forgets all he knows. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's certainly interesting. You know being that it, they forgot how to even speak their own language. So maybe it was more than just their language they forgot. I don't know. Rebecca is going to, uh, <laughs> for the next few weeks, bring up the legends of the Jews a lot. Uh, because she's, just so you guys know, she's actually doing like a clean sweep editing of the uh, entire book. And uh, so I'm looking forward of all four volumes. So I know she's like pouring through them right now reading. So she's a world of knowledge on the legends of the Jews. Do you know what the height of the dome is supposed to be, according to like anyone's research? It seems like a mile and a half or whatever it was is like so far away from the top that it, I, I don't know. The, the impression I get is that they wanted to get through the dome to uh, like kill the most high. So it was about height. Yeah. Right. So, yes, yes, it was about height, and that's according to the Book of Jasher, which I didn't quote from tonight. Uh, in their their plan was to, they had like three different war parties separated, and one third was going to set up like idols, and freakishly enough, I think another third was going up there to kill the Most High. They wanted to personally kill him. They would have had a lot of badass angels to get through first before they ever got to the throne room, but um, it, it, it was enough of a threat that you know, was like, uh, we gotta do something about this because they're, they're going to set their mind on... Looking down from two miles above the... Uh, ...seem to accomplish what's in their hearts. So, um, I don't know how high this mountain actually reached, if it is the tower, because it, it, only a third of it survived, right? So, this is why my theory is, is that the base would have just kept getting bigger and bigger. Like, they were literally, this tower they were building, they were literally building a mountain. And they were just going to keep slapping on the bricks and keep building and building and building and building for however long it took and until they got there. And uh, I guess the question is, is how, how many years away were they? Right. What, what was it? I don't have it in front of me. Maybe someone could quote. It said how long it would. It was so high up at one point. How many? I think months or years it would take to for a single brick to make it all the way up. Well, you know, Sarah, you a uh, one year. Yeah, Sarah uh, E says in here, how stupid would you have to be to think you could kill? Yeah. Well, this is one of the important things that I've um, brought up in the past that. I, I kind of think this is one of the big tests, um, you know, and not to have a murderous heart. And I kind of suspect that our life here underneath the firmament on this life, we're given this one chance. I think what Yahuwah wants to see is, is like, okay, if you're going to spend an eternity with me, all right, and I'm going to bring you into my house and I'm going to rule over you, can I trust you? Are you the sort of person that's going to try to stick a knife in my back 
when I have my back turned to you? And, you know, that's a, that's one of those questions. Uh, it's a horrible thought of, you know, you know, it, it's an unanswerable. I don't even want to really go there. Can the most high be killed? Uh, but the undoubtedly there are people that do want to kill him off. And, um, and as insane as that sounds, you know, Yahusha made it very simple. He's like, uh, if you're angry towards your brother, that's, um, that's the root of murder. How many people are angry at the most high don't even realize it? I mean, that's a shrink question. But, you know, who go through their life angry at him and uh, would, you know, if they had that opportunity, as crazy as sounds, you know, stick a knife in his back. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, 53 Gill says three days walk, uh, 30 plus miles a day equals. 100 plus miles at the base. I don't know. And now keep in mind too, that this three day walk, this journey, it's, it's, uh, I'm not exactly sure what they're, con what they're considering the base. And, you know, you are probably have a lot of elevation heights. So I don't know if it's just, you know, as the bird flies or including in the elevation and all that kind of stuff, what constitutes a three day walk. And in the stories, they were trying to kill him with bows and arrows. So, it's just idiotic. <laughs> they, they, I don't think they really thought they could. What do you guys think about Babylon as a whole? You know, we're supposed to escape Babylon. Do you guys have anything on that? Um, there's no tower now, right? But they are trying to unite us. Oh, I think there is a tower now, Michael. It's just the shape has changed, and it's 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 starts with a C and ends with a N, and there's an ER in the middle of it, and it's located in Switzerland. I think they're trying to rip open an, another door in a different way. I I just think they're they're going at it at it in a another method but i i think the intent may be the same i i'm not sure what they're trying to do over there but it seems like they're trying to rip something open they're going to end up ripping a new hole in themselves if you know, get my drift You know, that, that brings up an interesting question about, uh, you know, the best I can figure is they're either trying to rip open a portal into maybe in the, maybe rip open the firmament somehow, tunnel under the firmament, maybe open the abyss. I don't know. But, but if, if, if he's already been released from the abyss, why would they be trying to open the abyss? So, uh, uh it, it, it just, you know. That that's really that whole thing over there is bothering me because I feel like I'm missing something really obvious that I should be seeing. I mean, it's clearly satanic. They're clearly mocking us. They hold up Manila effect signs and have satanic rituals out in the open for all to see. And and you know, I I don't know. That's just I, I feel like I'm really missing something here. Well, okay, think about this transhumanism. Okay. The, the Cosmist, uh, they were the ones that started rocketry in the Soviet Union. Uh, then, you know, the Nazis brought over to NASA and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the Russian Cosmists, they were, they were highly inspired, the originals, by transhumanism. The whole goal of transhumanism is immortality, not just for us, but for all of our ancestors. Everyone in history, they want to resurrect everybody. This is straight. This is the goal of transhumanism. Okay, so think about what they're doing on on multiple levels right now. Uh, we have like the the metaverse that's getting going, and their their goal is to create some sort of Wally society. If you don't know the context of that, the the Pixar movie Wally is where like all the people of humanity is on some sort of spaceship, like just like fat and and like looking into like you know some fake reality. They're not in the reality. 
they want to put us all into a virtual world where we can cohabitate together. And the idea is, is to resurrect all of our ancestors into this too. That's a pretty frightening thought. So that might be where CERN is coming in where they, they very, I could see very easily that they want to open up a portal uh, into Sheol itself and release the, the, the souls of the dead. Um, you know, they, they might, we, we think of like, they're trying to release demons and other things. They might be doing that too, but in their minds, they might be doing the service of, you know, the injustice of, in their minds, the injustice of Yahuwah, that he would, you know, that he would conquer death, but leave out these people and they're going to bring them all into like a universal uh, Babylon society, right? A, a utopian society. So that's kind of, that's one of my thoughts about what they might be trying to do. And it all connects with everything, the metaverse and uh, transhumanism, everything that's happening. Well, and you know just, what, what okay. you just said about that and what Pam said, uh, she said they resurrected everybody into machines. Josh said something about finding the God particle. You know, maybe that's what the big push for all this AI is. Maybe they want to resurrect it into, you know, it, it, some somewhat using AI somehow. And it's n not literally resurrecting their bodies, but somehow out of their D. I, maybe that's why they want everybody's DNA. I don't know. It, it, it's I, I really feel like I'm missing something here. So are they pointing it towards abyss? They're pointing it to, towards the firmament. And why would, quote unquote, beasts come from the firmament, right? Does that make sense? Everybody can claims it. Can you, re can you restate that again? So Rebecca was saying that, you know, they're trying to open up the abyss with CERN, and I, I always thought it was pointed towards the firmament, and the abyss would not be in the firmament, and the beast would not be there. So it's, I would say that's two separate convos. Well, I mean, that's just, I'm just wondering if that was maybe one of the things they were trying to do. But then, you know, after Millennium, Millennial Kingdom, that doesn't really make sense. But I, I don't know what you mean by pointed at the firmament, because this whole thing is underground. It's a big tunnel under the ground. It's a circle. I don't know. Uh, I, thought, know, I, thought the, accelerator. I thought the thesis was that it was, this is what Tower of Babel was. Right. Oh well, I was just comparing CERN to the Tower of Babel. I was just oh, saying it was sorry. a different, it was a well, different I mean, form, but they were probably trying to do the same thing. I don't know. So gotcha. think about think about this in 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 ancient times. The I talked about this last week that the pyramids were not built by the Egyptians, at least not the good ones, and it actually goes against uh, Egyptian society because we're taught that they put mummies in there, which is ridiculous because the mummies would put down into the ground. The ancients buried people lower into the ground because it was connecting them to Sheol, which is below us. They all believe that Sheol was below us, whereas heaven is above us. So if you're going to build a pyramid, a mountain, it's leading towards heaven. It's the home of the gods. This is what the Zegarats are and all these kind of things. It's literally uh, the meeting place of the different Elohim on these locations. And I would say the same thing as the pyramid. Well, so the Tower of Babel, in that case, it's it's kind of a it's the finger pointing towards heaven, right? The middle finger. But CERN is, is different. It is down in the ground, and it reminds me of of the burial chambers of the ancients, and you know the the, the Grotto of Pan, and all these different things that in the mystery religions, how they would go down into the ground uh, to meet the Elohim down there, or the you know the gods of the underworld Dionysus is a big one because he was the the resurrection Elohim that came out of Sheol and it's the same thing with the the mysteries the Eleusinian mysteries they would go down into the caves because uh Pluto uh you know raped uh Persephone and that explains summer and winter and that kind of stuff and he took her underground and so they would go underground so whatever if the idea is is that CERN is underground it's connecting us to Sheol that's everything that I look at in the ancient world and all the different religion stuff, they are uh, contrast. They can, they are compared to Babel, but it's also contrasted mountain versus cave. You guys all see the difference. Yeah, and as Pamela says, they have a lot of uh, holodron colliders all over the earth. You said 30,000. Is that really that many? 
That's a lot. That's yeah. A, that's what I read. The, 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 they're not all huge like the one at CERN. CERN is a, a, an enormous. They call it, I think, a, a large hadron collider. But there are smaller ones all over the place. There, there's a few in the U.S. Um, I don't know how many. In fact, I, I really should look at all that. That's quite interesting. Those people uh, signing out and going night night. Goodbye, everybody. Tanisa, you know, um, get your beauty rest. And I'll actually be probably going out here soon too. We're, we're finishing earlier tonight, so if anyone has to go, Shabbat Shalom one last time. So Pamela says they have one in Tennessee. I thought they had one in maybe Texas too. They're probably, I mean, thirty thousand sounds like almost every city in the world at that point. I mean, that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot. <laughs> so that's more than I want to think about. If I, Irene or Rosalind want to speak, you guys are server muted. Just let us know. You know, there's been a lot of reports of uh, unexplained booms all over the U S and I, I, you know, I, I know that they've got a lot of them, a, a lot of these Hadron colliders. And I kind of wonder if that's not maybe the source of all these things. There, there's nobody's ever, you know, well, nobody's fessing up at any rate as to what the booms are. And the media claims they have no idea what it is. You know, they, they've looked into it and it's reported all over. I mean, Tucson alone, in the last five years, there's been a whole bunch of them, and I mean loud, and uh, heard all over town by hundreds and hundreds of people, and nobody can explain it. Maybe it's the uh, the soft soil here in the Carolina and the 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 lowlands of the Carolinas, but I'm not hearing those booms here. Has anybody else here heard the booms? I'd be curious if there's more people in this room who've heard them. Something I've always been wanting to hear is I remember like 10 years ago, these were really popular and I haven't heard about them recently. Maybe I'm just not researching it, but the, uh, what's been described as like trumpet blast, you know, like the really loud, um, almost sounds like a, like shofar blasting in the sky. And some people are saying those are coming from underground too, but, um, I would love to hear one of those. The only thing I'm hearing around here is that the alligators, those suckers are loud. All right, guys. Well, it's kind of quieting down in here, um, and people are kind of leaving, saying good night. So, yeah, good night, everybody who's leaving. And does anyone have anything yeah. last they want to say? No, you want to mention your Zen interview? Oh yeah, yeah. This this Thursday, uh, I will be going on with Zen, and we'll be talking about. I think he was, you know, really excited to get me on about this because uh, Rebecca is in the room with us, and she has been. I'll be dropping her name as well this this Thursday. She was been incredibly helpful in editing, and we. Uh, she did a, most of the heavy lifting, so she deserves most of the credit for this. But this has been a dream project of mine for a long time to take the uh, the eighteen nineties uh, London or England based zetetic literature, which is flat Earth literature, the Earth Not a Globe review. And lift those off the page, off the photos, and put it onto uh, actual book form. And she did a beautiful job. And so this is, of course, available in our bookstore now here, and I'll be talking about it. So this is the first time it's ever been done. And we've taken the first eight volumes word for word and and put them down. And you see these guys in the, the 1800s, uh, you know, it was interesting time because, you know, Darwin is alive and his bulldog and all those, the, the original, uh, well, he might've been dead by then. When did he officially die? But this was, you know, the generation and, um, and they're, they're debating, they're arguing against evolutionists. They're, a lot of these people were, um, 
you know, anti grape ju uh, juice uh, that was starting to get passed around then. A lot of these people were pro Sabbath, Seventh Day Sabbath, really interesting group of people. So I'm excited to talk about this. I'll be doing it on Thursday nights, and hopefully you guys can, you know, we'll have a little watch party here at this Discord page, the Unexpected Cosmology, as I talk to Zen about it. So uh, I'll see you guys around this week, and uh, we'll do this again next Sabbath, of course. Hopefully I'll have Romans 6 ready, and we'll be doing Chapter 12, maybe 13, uh, Michael and I. And I'll see you guys then. Shabbat shalom. We're going to need the drinking word. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i'll come up with one we'll figure it out uh all right guys shabbat shalom one last time it's gotta be better than last times <laughs>